Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the Region 15 Board of Education to order for Monday, March 15th. Can we all start by please standing for the Pledge of Allegiance? The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, and under the peace of God. It is so wonderful to hear so many voices saying the Pledge of Allegiance, especially you guys. It's always a treat, so thank you. The mission of Region 15, a collaborative community committed to excellence, is to educate every student to be productive, ethical, and engaged in a global society through proven and innovative learning experiences supported by a strong community whose decision-making is based on the best interest of all students. We are going to start with our student representatives, Ms. Chelsea James and Mr. Robert Labonia. So good evening, good evening everybody. Um, and LMES News, from Sunday, March 24th to Saturday, April 6th, um, LMES will be having their Spiritwear spirit wear sale online. And on Friday, March 29th, there will be no school due to Good Friday. Um, Monday, March, April 8th to Friday, April 12th, will be the LMES Scholastic Book Fair. On Friday, April 12th, will be the Bagel Buddies from 7.30 to 9 o'clock a.m. On Monday, April 15th through Friday, April 19th, there will be no school for April break. On Monday, May 13th, there will be an early dismissal for professional development. And the PTO needs more help to plan fun LMES at or fun events at LMES. And um, with a variety of ways that you can get involved, such as committee chair, recess supply coordinator, and executive board members. Um, those are just some of the ways that you can. And if you are interested, you can contact Tim Foster. The recent LMES reading extravaganza was a success. Um, from the read aloud by Mrs. Wormuth, Mr. Wormuth, and Mrs. Milo, to the lively presence from Jasper Rabbit, Rabbit in the cafeteria, it was an evening filled with literary fun. Two of the fifth grade students at LMES are creating a club to help the St. Vincent de Paul homeless shelter in Waterbury. And they will be collecting a variety of clothes, such as pants, sweatshirts, shirts, socks, and as a bonus, water bottles and chapstick. PHS students will be hosting an unforgettable child care night just for parents, where they can drop off their children here at PHS um, from kindergarten to fifth grade. And there will be an evening filled with games, activities, and a scavenger hunt. And while the kids are entertained, parents can enjoy much needed downtime. And this event will be held on April 5th from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. at PHS. The LMES PTO is excited to host a family bingo night. And this event will take place on Thursday, March 28th. And to accommodate as many families as possible, there will be two time slots, one from 5 to 6 p.m., and the second from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. There will be prizes for the children and an opportunity to pre-order pizzas for families. And unfortunately, due to the limited space, there will be a lottery determining who will be attending. The Region 15 annual art show is coming up and uh, we are looking for volunteers to help here at PHS. The event will be held um, on April 26th and it will be held from 6 to 9 o'clock p.m. And the second date is April 27th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Also in LMES news, the PTO Mac and Cheese Drive. Um, the LMES community continues to bake monthly uh, or to collect monthly mac and cheese boxes for the Southbury Food Bank. And the goal for the PTO is to donate at least 40 boxes a month. So this month is being sponsored by the fourth and fifth grade families. And effective of 2024 and 2025 school year, the Public Act 23-208 requires 
students to be five years old by September 1st to enroll into the kindergarten. And this changed from the previous date of January 1st of enrollment. So Region 15 will be accepting students who turn five by January 1st per written request from the family member. Students will then participate in screening assessments in areas such as academic, social, health, behavioral, and community communication skills. And for those who complete the initial kindergarten registration forms, schools will be reaching out by the end of January with the ne next steps regarding registration. In PES news, a big thank you to the PTO for providing snacks on conference days and it was much appreciated. Last week, PTO PES had their 10 finalists recite the digits of pi live on their morning show and also picked their book full of PES representatives. March 29th will be no school for Good Friday. April 1st is the book full finalists at PHS at six o'clock. April 3rd is a PTO meeting at 7 p.m. April 15th through the 19th is spring recess, no school. And Palm Frog Elementary School is pleased to welcome author Jean Furlow who uh, through the author and illustrator program through PHS. Um, they also wanted to extend a special thank you to the PTO for providing funding for this exciting enrichment program. And during the week of April 22nd, Mrs. Furlow will visit and discuss her career and the books that she has created. And lastly, in GES news, for the last week of March, GES will be having a Spirit Week and invite all, they invite all students to participate. So today, March 25th, they had Cozy Reading Jammy Day. Tomorrow, Tuesday, March 26th, they will be having Shiny Reading Flashlight Day. Wednesday, March 27th, they will have Beach Reading and you can bring a towel. And March 28th will, dress as a book, will be Dress as a Book Character Day as the grand finale. GES also will be having their Bus Driver Appreciation Week to kick off in April. And April 5th will also be the Pomp Rock High School Parents Day Out. April 8th is Solar Eclipse Day. So due to the unpredictability of weather conditions and safety considerations considering concerning eye protection um, and the timing of the eclipse being during elementary dismissal, this event will be outdoor or this event will be broadcasted, so the students will be watching through a live stream. Um, April 23rd, fourth grade spring chorus concert presented by Miss Ashley Dunn, and this will be held at Gainford Elementary School in their gymnasium at 6.30 p.m., and students should arrive at 6.15. And May 9th is the fifth grade musical concert presented by Ashley Dunn and Mr. Michael Mosca. Mosca, I'm not sure how I pronounce that. Um, this will be in the Gainfield Gymnasium um, once again at 6.30. And lastly, the book fair will be held this Wednesday, March 27th for students to shop. Thank you, Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, starting at Rochambeau Middle School, uh, RMS intramural dance is just starting up. Registration is open. Uh, practices will vary throughout the spring, but we'll start directly after school, and only 25 slots are available. Uh, the Rochambeau Book Fair starts started today, March 25th. It's going through March 28th. And the day following that is Good Friday. There will be no school. Uh, boys baseball and girls softball tryouts start on the 27th of March. Um, and starting April 11th, every Thursday, Unified Kickball and Track will begin this week event will go to 4 p.m. at uh, every Thursday. And order your books are due by April 12th. Uh, moving to Memorial Middle School, the RMS and MMS Roller Skate Night was held at Roller Magic on March 15th. Roller Magic was closed to the public and students were accompanied by their parents during this event. Girls softball tryouts start on March 18th, or started on March 18th. Boys baseball starts on March 27th. And following that is Good Friday, so there will be no school. And a big congratulations to the Memorial Middle School math team. Mm -hmm. uh, they got a first place. They got first place at Math Caps, which is a New England math tournament. Uh, and 
Lastly, at Upright High School, uh, spring sports are one weekend, a little over one weekend for boys, boys and girls lacrosse, softball, baseball, girls golf, boys volleyball, and track and field. Uh, student council is holding a lucky duck competition. Ducks will be hidden throughout the whole school. And once you find one of many ducks hidden throughout the school, you can go to the main office and claim your prize. Senior scholarships are due uh, Wednesday, March 27th. And the senior year experience projects will be held uh, on March 27th as well. Um, seniors have been working on this for almost a whole year now. And uh, it will be a good time for the seniors to show what they've worked with. Uh, SAT day is also the 27th. And uh, Culinary 2 and Italian 3 make pasta during their class periods. And if you want to find it, it is on Pop Eats on Instagram. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions for Ms. James? Going on the reports. Where's our pop dad? No. <laughs> what are your uh, senior project topics? So I took AP Capstone. So last year I uh, researched the topic of inclusivity and diversity throughout the years of cosmetics in cosmetic industries. Yeah. So that will be very I also took AP Capstone and AP Research. So last year I researched um, peer tutoring within Region 15 and how it's effective to the students and if I can make it better. So, cool. Thank you. All right. Um, before we move on, I just wanted to let everybody know that Mr. Olson is participating online. He has a work commitment, um, just that people know. Um, we'll have next, we have our student performance, the GES fifth grade course club. So, welcome everybody. Can you hear us in the back? We're working on audio, so we're trying. All right, I know you guys can hear me. So, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Dunn, and she's going to introduce our star performers this evening. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. So, um, I'm joined tonight by the fifth grade chorus club. These are members of fifth grade who are interested in learning a little bit more about some more complicated vocal repertoires. We meet before school every Wednesday, um, and they're a wonderful group of students. We have a lot of fun together. So we're here tonight in celebration of March being Music in Our Schools Month, and they're going to perform a song for you called One Day by an artist named Modest Yahoo. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was so good. Thank you. 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 Every board meeting, so it's not right. We'll start a jet, you get them to tell you. Uh, maybe wait, right? All right, so now we're going to transition from some of our um, youngest students to maybe the other end of the spectrum, and we'll move from uh, our music program to our athletic program. Yeah. So I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Plasky, uh, and he's going to talk about the all states and some state champions. Yes. We're probably out of cookies at this point. Right. Not one thing. We need to adjust the sash. <laughs> Both opportunity for us. I'll be back next week. All right, so tonight I'm here to recognize um, uh, winter all state athletes. So I'd like to call up and uh, honor the following athletes that were named or earned first team all state honors in their respective sports. Uh, we'd like to congratulate. Uh, these individuals on this outstanding, outstanding accomplishment. So when I call your name, please come up and be recognized. Uh, first person I know is not here. She uh, let me know she wasn't going to be able to be here. Um, and that's Gianna Tulo. She is a cheerleading uh, member of our cheerleading team that um, got all state this year. And it's the first time we've had an all state cheerleader in, in several years. So congratulations to Gianna. Um, our next all state athlete is a gymnast, and it's Emily Bevilacqua. I 
the rest are from our boys uh, championship swim team. So boys, when I call you up, you're going to come on up and you'll go around yep. that direction yep. and shake hands with all of the members of the board of ed. Uh, so our first one is David Capiello. Long way of time. No, it's fine. Yeah. 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 No, it's a good job. Breaking the mold here. Congratulations. Thank you. 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 Thank Jake Blair's 2022 state championship. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. You basically have a wardrobe. <laughs> totally. Next is Braden Green. <laughs> Next would be Jason Who. Congratulations, Next athlete would be Logan Queen. Next would be Cole McCurry. Congratulations, Her seventh swimmer would be Miles Montello. Next would be Bobby Regan. The class and me, Bobby broke one of our school records. Oh, my brother. Which brother? Congratulations, Bobby. Next year, same thing. Congratulations. Next would be Brandon Schuessler. Congratulations, Brandon. And last but not least would be Michael Totola. So now we'd like to congratulate the boys swim and dive team on their outstanding season. Uh, these numbers that are about to read to you may sound insane, and that's because they actually are. The team completed another undefeated dual meet season this year, 
And then they followed that by winning their 12th straight Southwest Conference Championship. And their 18th in the last 19 years. I mean, just think about that for a second. 12 straight, 18 in the last 19 years. In this year's SWC Championship, the team scored 711 points. And the second place team had 376. That's complete domination. Uh, next came the CIAC Class M State Championships, where the team won their fourth Class M State Championship in the past five years, with the opportunity to have it five straight years taken away by the you know, pandemic, of course. In this meet, the team scored an amazing 891 points, with the runner-up scoring 529 points. But think about that a little bit. I mean, these are the best of the best competing. Again, more complete domination over their competitors. <clears throat> and this may sound crazy, but the most impressive feat of all this year may have been finishing second overall in the state open championship meet against schools almost twice our size. The team narrowly lost to Greenwich High School. So first I'd like to congratulate the entire team and the following coaches. Um, you guys could stand up as I call the coaches and then the players, you could uh, get the line right behind them. So head coach, Fran Pantino. <laughs> Assistant coach, Tim Noel. <laughs> Assistant coach, Mike Bimmelis. <laughs> Well and I don't believe our diving coach Lee McClinton is here tonight, uh, but Lee is the final part of the team. Thank you. Thank you so much for making Region 15 proud, guys, really. Thank you. And out of that, we drain the pool. Okay. <laughs> right. Don't go, don't go in the pool. Yeah, it's going to be a pump pool. Don't get the pool now. We jump in the pool? Why don't we know, right? Why don't we jump in the pool? We're in the pool. When it opens, when it opens, golf, that was water, right? I'm jumping. Well, yeah, let's fundraise. Yeah, let's go. 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 Let's go.
It's so quiet in here now. Oh, no one is sleeping. Going to one. This is the sad part. I know. It's just depressing. Oh, the energy. Yeah, the energy all leaves. Come on, they eat all the cookies. That's the question. We think all the cookies are gone. All right, Mr. Martino, we're going to start this. So, we begin. We begin. All right. Thank you all we for so well. coming here for the exciting grant. Uh, we believe this is the first time that this presentation has taken place in it's recent recent history, let's say. I don't know how far back we, we didn't do our research. Um, definitely in the, the last 10 or 12 years. Um, so these are uh, grants. These are uh, Most of these are entitlement grants. There's a few competitive. And, um, and an entitlement grant are grants that are formula driven to school districts. Most of these come from federal government through the state government um, for public schools. We're going to talk a little bit tonight about the difference between um, supplanting school budgets and supporting school budgets. All federal grants can only support a school budget. You can't um, take what should be funded by the local community and replace those funds with federal funds. So we're going to talk about Title I and Title II. Uh, Title I, the main purpose is uh, to provide children with an opportunity to receive a fair and equitable education. There's a lot of definitions that go into what qualifies for supporting that. Um, and then Title II is um, the instructional piece, mostly seen uh, by professional de the development opportunities. Uh, Title IV is uh, specific to uh, areas. We don't get a lot of money in Title IV. We get $10,000 in Title IV. Uh, and that's supposed to help school uh, improve school conditions for student learning. So again, a lot of that happens through smaller professional development grants. Um, and then in Title I, that you can see the dollar amounts there, we get about 127000 in Title I funds. Title II is about 50000 And then Title III is um, designed to provide ML services to students who speak languages other than English as their primary language um, and to work towards that language proficiency. Um, our Title III grant, we only get uh, $9,500, uh, and we're a part of a consortium for that grant. So Ed Advance helps us manage that grant because it, it's so small. Uh, we also get some special education grant funding. One of those, that IDEA grant, we get about $896,000. This mostly provides paraprofessional support. Uh, and then the 619 grant is... Um, specific to preschool, uh, we only get about $31,000 in that grant. Uh, and so this is where the federal law hasn't moved um, to match Connecticut law specifically. Um, but this is where if we did not have this grant, the paraprofessionals that are funded through this grant would fall uh, to our budget. So um, these grants are massively helpful to fund the uh, again, support for students with special needs. In addition to these grants, there are the ESSER grants. These were um, sunset. So, and these are the ones you probably had the most touch points with in the last couple of years. So we, how we use those ARP ESSER grants, if you remember, we subsidized the four person team last year. So we only paid for half of that. Uh, and then the other half is in this year's budget. Uh, the portable classrooms, uh, and that's how we spent our 1.1 million on those. Uh, so the other state grants, these are, uh, the first one is the security grant. That is a competitive grant. We apply for that, we get awarded. It's also a matching grant. So um, those funds that you see there have to have equal amounts of funds from us on the other side. The right to read grant, again, was, it's kind of a hybrid, I would say, in that, the state set aside money for school districts um, and our allocation was set by the state, but we couldn't access that money unless we applied for it and met certain criteria. 
the high dosage math tutoring, uh, tutoring, that was a competitive grant. You had to fill out the application. You had to meet certain benchmarks and criteria. Um, and I just, to clear up a little bit, that math tutoring wasn't necessarily based on um, school performance. Any school district could apply for that grant. Um, I would, in this case, uh, highlight um, Dr. Chiapetta and our math um, department chair, our coaches, principals worked really hard on that grant. The reason we got so much money was because we met a lot of the criteria that other districts said were too hard to meet. So a lot of people worked on that one. Um, and I think we were the third highest allotment in the state. And again, that's not because of our performance. It's purely because we understood the process and were committed um, to doing this during the school day and in person. A lot of um, schools did after school um, and remote because that was a um, easier thing to manage, um, but they didn't get as much money. Um, the dual credit expansion is the one that we just went through uh, pretty recently. That's gonna fund um, ECE credits here at the high school. The Perkins grant is an entitlement grant. That's an annual grant again. We don't have to apply for that. Uh, we have to apply, but as long as we submit the application, um, and that really funds kind of our CTE, our college and, and um, our career and tech ed program. So it's very specific what those funds can go to. Um, but when we talk a little later about um, culinary or um, some of the other pieces down in the tech ed, you can use some of this money annually to help support that. And then the adult ed grant, we also worked with Ed Advance to run the adult ed because $13,000 is not enough to run a full-fledged program. So a lot of districts that get small amounts of money are in a consortium run by an advance that runs the adult ed program. They actually use space at Harvard High School for that program. And that is um, the scope of competitive and entitlement grants that come here to the Any questions? Any questions on grants, Tom? You're the one who no? This came as a product of our brainstorming of presentations yeah. that we wanted to add. So and we keep looking at yeah. more. I mean, there's there's a lot of small grants here, and there a robotics grant we just went after, and that went to look like a lot more larger school districts than Southern County Cross. We don't necessarily have someone that we've hired to be a grant writer. We're kind of in, a, in an awkward here. spot. So like we're not really big as a school district. Um, and a lot of the formulas behind the applications have needs connected, like your food and lunch rate and some of your um, socioeconomic conditions that we don't hit. So the cost benefit of putting on a full-time grant writer. Um, but we don't have them. We so we're not getting these grants because people here are doing the work. That's correct. Yeah, that's yep. what I, yeah, that's yep. what I was that is correct. Um, Dr. Chiapetta's office does a lot of them. Um, some of the smaller ones, um, we collaborate with uh, some of the teachers, instructional leaders. There's there's other like smaller grants that, um, but these are all state and federal grants. So if this comes from like the community foundation, we would put that here. That'd be much like dollar amount wise smaller. Um, some of the community conversations that you've seen have been supported by grants. Sometimes they're in kind. Um, so it may not be dollar amount. It might be a service, a speaker they'd provide. Um, like our wellness fair is kind of a grant funded through um, our health insurance company. Uh, so again, there's there's no real dollars that we get for that, but we submit the bills to them and they bring in a speaker or a service um, to promote wellness in the district. But yeah, that all happens through different departments and people here. That's the uh, I apologize if I missed this at the beginning, but something like the security camera reimbursement or the HVAC reimbursement, are those considered grants or are those reimbursements? <laughs> It's, it's a, it's a matching competitive grant. So we have to show them that we have, if we ask for 200,000, we have to show them that we have 200,000 in resources um, allocated to that and that the full project is 400,000. Uh, in our budget presentation this year, in the revenue sources slide, we have a line for agency placed grant. So can you talk about what an agency placed agency grant is? Agency placed grant. That is excess cost. Oh. In CF place. So excess cost is state funded in um, response to the formula four and a half times our first student. And then over that, we get 88 or 68% reimbursement on that. So um, that's the excess cost grant. That's not in 
here. I guess we could have put that we in here, but I guess we kind of already talked about that. So we can we can put that in here. And then the agency place grant um, is connected to excess costs. So if we have um, a student living here that the state places outside of us, whether that be through DCF or um, some other state organization, we get funded um, at the um, excess cost reimbursement percentage, but it's only one time our per student cost, not four and a half times. So the threshold's a lot smaller because we had nothing to do with the placement, we just inherited that. We could we could put the yeah, excess cost right in here. Though. Was the idea that like tuition if a student is placed in our district, like like we would charge out of district tuition? It would, no, it would be like if one of our students were placed in an outside facility. So let's say DCF um, uh, determined that uh, a family in our community um, could no longer support their child or whatever, and that organization decided to place them in some type of specialty facility. Usually, um, it could be private or public, but it's usually a special education facility of some type. Um, and we'd still fill out the excess cost grant, just as if we placed the student there, but the formula changes from four and a half times to one time. So we would get, again, this is where that the, the fall in excess cost hurts us because we do have a couple of children that um, are in an agency place. But instead of getting 88% of that cost beyond a one time, um, so our per pupil is 21,000. So instead of getting, and if it's $100,000 school, instead of getting 80% of 80,000, we're getting 65% of 80,000, or of 80%. Where in the other ones where it's four and a half times, we have to exceed the $90,000 threshold and we get reimbursed for everything after that. So with that same student, we're getting 60% of $10,000 as opposed to 80% of $10,000. So that isn't as impactful for our budget. Right. Those one-time ones really kind of uh, exacerbate the, the shortfall. Any other questions? Well, we now have a start, so we can yeah. roll with questions going forward. Yeah, that's good. Going away, which is for that. So, an answer 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 one. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. She went on that. No, it wasn't. Heating and air conditioning. Yeah. We didn't get it yet. Hold on. Yet? Yet. All right. Yet. All right. Fair yeah. enough. Let's, let's. I'll leave it to letter. All right. All right. We might have to amend it, hopefully, quickly. That'll be a blast if we yeah. get that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, next, may I have approval for the minutes of the March 6th budget workshop? Motion to approve. Motion, Motion to approve. Thank you, Second. Shannon. Second by Heather. Any questions, comments? Um, we'll do, Jeff, are you here? I'm here. Yep, okay, so how do you vote for the March 6th budget workshop minutes? Aye. Aye, okay. Richard, how do you vote for the minutes? Aye. Aye. Sally? Aye. 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 Heather? Aye. Tom? Aye. Tom and I? Heather? Aye. Steve Serrani, aye. Aye. All right, thank you. Um, next, may I have a motion for approval of the March 11th regular meeting minutes? So moved. Thank you, Heather. Second. Then by Heather Rogers. Any discussion, comments? All right, Jeff, how are you on this? Aye. Aye. Great, Richard. Aye. Sally. Aye. Sharon Adam. Aye. 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 I'm an aye. Heather Rogers. Aye. Steve Sarani. Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. It carries. Next, we have information and proposals, board committee reports, policy and curriculum committee, Ms. Heather Dwyer. Policy and curriculum did not meet earlier today. Um, let me just cancel as an act of mercy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, um, you will see before you a pretty sizable packet. This is our first reads of our first batch of 5,000 policies that we were sending to the board. It's a first read. Uh, when we went through 5,000 policies, we grouped them by subject area. So these are all policies having to do with um, attendance and uh, um, you know who who is who goes to our schools. <laughs> um, so 
you will see before you um, uh, seven policies that we have done. Um, they're as part of our process, when we go through a block of policies and we're ready to move them to the full board, we send them to Kate to give like a last read and the feedback. So this was supposed to be eight policies, but there's seven before you because Kate did have some comments about one policy, and we'll bring that back to you soon. Um, but if you look before you, um, these are all fairly dry policies that um, you know are based on statute. Um, but certainly, as you're reading through them, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to discuss. But happy bedtime reading to you all. Thank you. So I just have a question. So the comments, right, because I, I read these before okay. uh, the meeting, right, just kind of means like, right, this whole attendance piece, right, it's a new policy, like, is that, like, this is brand new to the district, and then, like, the red marks are changes we've made to an existing yeah, policy? so uh, you will see, some of them will have markup, um, and if it's, like, red cross out, it's something that, you know, maybe we had a model policy and we removed the language. Um, and some of it will be, it looks like they did it in red as well, but some of it is language that we have. Okay, yeah, because I because the first one says a new policy, so I didn't know if like attendance was a new. Yeah, a lot of these are policies that we didn't already have. So um, when you look at um, the notes above the policy, yeah, um, it will usually tell you. So for example, 5118 was an existing policy. But I do think that most of these were removed that we didn't have. Or well, they were numbered. Or they or they, they were, were like, renumbered. Yes. Were, okay. I, I guess my my question on absentee, because I have this as a parent a lot, and I have other people ask me, right? Like I get a lot of people ask for my youngest one to come with this. Right. Mm -hmm. The first nine, it like doesn't matter. Right, so then it's like, okay, maybe he was sick and he had a bunch of ortho stuff and I have notes for all of that. But then when you trigger 10 and he has like the stomach flu, the doctor's like, he's not coming in here. <laughs> right, like, but the school's like, well, we need to know. And it's because it's 10. So like, I guess like, and I think that causes some anxiety for parents around this nine time situation when it's, there could be a whole bunch of excused ones before that, but 10 necessarily shouldn't be the one because it's arbitrarily a number versus whatever so does this absolutely so uh i mean that's a good question because you and all the people writing into you are not alone yes <laughs> i know that <laughs> um i do think this okay. is i don't know, would you like to say i'm just gonna that? that step by the state it's not an us thing that mm -hmm. yeah. um, mm -hmm. there's two kind of um Catalyst for that letter. So usually around like seven or eight, uh, we let parents know that you're approaching. So yep, I get one of those. The, the two magic numbers from the state department are ten and eighteen. So at eighteen, the state considers you chronically absent because you've missed ten percent of the school. Yeah. So but yeah, so those so and some of that is it's really a um, accountability system for the school system that are we communicating with parents. Do we have a plan? Are we watching those students to make sure they don't fall academically behind? Um, so, I mean, that's that we can't change that. Okay. Um, I understand parents' frustration. I know that um, some of our administrators are here earliest this evening. They share some of those frustrations. And, and I think there's a wide spectrum. If your child's out because of an illness or something that we're working together on, that's fine. I think this, the state's point is. Our parents conscious of if if you're pulling a child out for two weeks because there's a once in a lifetime whatever um, thing that you're gonna think maybe an, an eclipse that's, that's like, gonna happen and your family's traveling there for a couple of days like that's fine but if you're hitting like 16 or 18 days and you're doing that like those are some of the things they, they want to make sure there's dialogue between the district and the family so that that's um, and then you'll notice that on our next gen accountability there's an indicator on attendance um, and how many students we get kind of rated on how many students in our district um, are hit that chronically absent number. Um, and I can't remember if it's 3% or 5%, I think it's 5% that we need to be kind of under to get credit for that. And again, some of that is to motivate us as a school district to make sure that we have structures and systems in place to make sure, I know families might not like that letter, but that tells me our systems and structures are working 
um, and that we're meeting on a regular basis to review students who might be starting to get uh, more absences. And again, are we doing something to make sure that child doesn't slip through a crack somewhere? Well, and that's kind of the piece, right? Like. So Enzo Cavallo pushes you over that list every year. But like a lot of it is like he goes to school, he gets nervous, he throws up. They're like, he can't come back here for like all these days. And I'm like, well, he's fine. He's just kind of, the nurse now is better than one in the past where I was like, well, like he throws up 30 times a year in school. Like we just can't have him out 30 days. But it's like, it's kind of like a frustration, right? On the other side too, it's like, you're sending me a letter, but you're telling me my kid can't come to so school. So it is interesting. This law was passed before COVID. Uh, and so there is kind of this conversation of, well, we don't want to take any risks, you know, um, and if you need Tylenol to keep your fever down, then maybe, you know, you should stay home and do that. Um, and so I do think that there, there's an active conversation. The challenge that all of us are facing in public school is that post-COVID, so before COVID, we had attendance issues in our schools, in, in some school districts. And you're talking like, 30 or 40 percent of the students are hitting that chronic, chronically absent. Like some of them were huge. Um, and so if kids aren't in school, they can't learn. At the same time, we don't want students coming to school sick and getting other students sick. So um, we're trying to, to work through that a little bit. That's where I would say, like, families shouldn't be worried about it, but there should be a conversation and somebody should be checking in because we don't want a student that um, can't be in school for whatever reason to fall behind. And at the same time, I think from a school district standpoint, I, I understand that traveling in October is cheaper because flights are easier to get, but like that's when school's happening. Um, and your child can't learn if they're not here. Um, and we can't have necessarily staff creating like learn at leisure kinds of packets to, to send out. And so, you know, can we find some balance in that? And honestly, like as a district, we do our our attendance rates have improved tremendously post COVID. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but we're in single digits. I mean, uh, I think most in most of our schools were below that five percent threshold, and in a couple of schools um, we're at like seven percent or so. But but this is an active conversation for many of our uh, administrators trying to work with families to again, if kids aren't in school, we can't teach them. Just going to say your um, comments are not in isolation. It was a very active discussion when this was discussed at PNC. Oh, and from, yeah, I mean, from my perspective, there's a dichotomy, right? There's an assessment that the state holds us to. Clearly, it's a measure yeah. relative to performance, but you have COVID, flu, strep, RSV, this disease. And to your point, certain it's easy to get one or all of those things <laughs> once. And right there, you're over the 10 days. So it's, um, I think, really, really hard. I think some of it is judgment, as you said, um, and discretionary and keeping people safe. But I do think that something should shift post-COVID and how we're evaluating 10 days. 10 days can get even very, very, very quick. Um, and it does create a sense of anxiety in many parents, like, getting this letter and maybe it's March, right? And we still got a couple months left to go. <laughs> <have a> <laughs> so it creates a lot of anxiety in my house. I'm like, I cannot be this letter. So you don't want to cause a lot of, like so I hear about causes this. a lot of anxiety. I'm like, oh, yeah. I appreciate perish. the families that feel anxiety about it because that means like you're conscious. It's the families that, that aren't as conscious of it. And and there's also a spectrum too. Like if your child is school phobic and having trouble coming to school every day, then we need to engage with them and get them to school. Just to put this in perspective, I think for younger yeah. parents mm -hmm. of younger children, it's such a hot topic. Like I ask, any feedback on the budget? They're like, no, but that attendance policy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where the focus is. So I find that very interesting. It's a very hot topic, I think, because people are trying to balance getting their kids to school and you know, the optics they want to learn, but they also want to keep people safe and they don't want to send their school, their, their child to school sick and get other kids sick. And and sometimes they have to go and pick up their kids, right? So it's it's a really, it's a good time. Well, and it ha from time to time it happens where our um, well-meaning legislators and State Department officials are trying to fix a problem, uh, but the solution doesn't work the same everywhere. So in districts that truly struggle with students that are just not coming to school, and again, that's not necessarily elementary, but it could be, 
um, and are completely apathetic, this policy will have a beat to it. And in places where your attendance is pretty good, it creates a lot of anxiety for families that really do try to get their kids to school. Not that this isn't a problem here. Like we do have some places where this <laughs> is a problem. I think the complaints that I hear more often aren't that their children have been sick, it's that they want to go on vacation. Um, that's what I hear more of. Or if my child gets sick one more day, we can't pull them out for vacation. <laughs> <laughs> this struggle and every yeah. family is unique and you know kids go through peaks and valleys and yeah. so i mean it, it's an active it's that piece. first nine days yeah. thing where they're like oh you know and then you hit 10 and it's like oh god and that's triggered by it again yeah. it's the, the state statute like we can't you can uh, easily hit five days in one week like yeah. Yeah. like that all right yeah. any so, other questions go ahead richard a clarification that we have um most of these policies that you're writing about follows the state law. Am I correct? Yes. I mean, okay. we, we and our done... homeless one also follows federal law. Is that mm -hmm. right? Federal, federal, federal. Okay. So the policies are just our reflections on the state and federal law. Yes. So we took so, we took model policies on each of these yeah. that were recommended by Kate with our based on state. So we have basically we have to follow yes. what applies. And at the end of every one of these policies, you'll see references to the statutes that right. policy references. So. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. My question is similar. Um, five one one eight and five one. I should say five one two three. So the non-resident attendees. Um, Promotion retention. So at the top, the notes mentioned that we, I think these are the only two in the packet where we had the policy already that was appropriate. Was written. I happen to remember, like, did the decay policies vastly different, or, you know, what, what was the discussion about keeping keeping our policy versus replacing it? And, and you can tell me, like, I, I, I can, I would have to go back to give you specifics on each policy. Um, but in general, we value brevity. Okay. <laughs> um, but certainly, I can go back and I can tell you, um, you know, what uh, what swayed us as to whether we were going to maybe keep or amend our existing policy versus you know, use the paid model policy. Yeah, it's, I if it's like easy. I don't. You don't need to. I have the notes. I just don't have them completed. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on Heather's report? All right. Thank you. Next, we have our superintendent's report. The students did a really good job of covering a lot of things that I <laughs> would talk to. So uh, I'll skip over um, really just that um, kindergarten registration information is on the website. There are There is a way for any of the people that uh, want to go through that process. That's detailed on the website. Also on the website, I put it in uh, my notes to the community yesterday. The web page with all of the bond projects is now kind of up and running. We do have a graphic. We're having a little issue making it readable on the website. It's a little too big, so we're working on some formatting issues. But there'll be a graphic up there, and then um, we'll start adding. I think there's a couple of pictures up there, but we'll, we have a lot more pictures that we'll start to pop that kind of highlight everything. Um, it is Music Appreciation Month, so I was thankful to the uh, students and families that came out. We also had our musical this weekend. Um, and then it's also Board Appreciation Month. In the last last week specifically, I was in a lot of me meetings with a lot of people from other districts. And um, I know that sometimes um, this is hard work, but I just want you guys to know that you're doing a good job and uh, this is a good place. And there's a lot of uh, school districts where people would be happy uh, to trade places with you and to, to wrestle with the challenges we have here. So um, it's just sometimes good to hear that from, from other places. So that's okay. my report. All right. Any questions for Mr. Smith on this report? Nope. All right, next we have board member comments. Everyone's saving it all for But we're time. holding, right? That's a budgetary. The budget, the budget <laughs> we're going to hold for the discussion. Oh, oh, yeah. So I just want to say that the play this weekend was so, so good, and we should be so proud of our students, so proud of the students, right, who put that performance on. It was executed flawlessly, so just really well. I, I, I guess I do have a question. That sound system is new? 
<laughs> I mean, it was a little challenging to hear. So I was like, wait, I thought this was a new sound system. I'm trying to flip through my phone. Okay. So the soundboard is new. Okay. Um, and some of the components are new, um, but not the entire sound system. So that the um, the board that ran it all um, had like round fuses and things that um, uh, from like the 1980s, um, and that all had to be replaced. Um, I don't know if there'll be new speakers going in with the. I think those big side speakers. Yeah, lot of speakers got uh, gone. Got so, gone. So I don't know. Not um, here from the back. When people are talking on stage, so that was yeah. it was so good, and mm -hmm. the little boy. And I forget his name at this point. He was playing really well. It was, his voice was so good, but he was a more soft spoken child. So the carrying of that, there was even points where people were like, shh, because they wanted to hear what was happening. So I'm just, and maybe I'll save this for like a, a line budget yeah. item because I thought it was new and I really would like, it's not new, like for, um, Right, for us to be able to do some more justice. So I don't know, well, I, I'll, I'll look into it. I don't know if that was a speaker issue or like an adjustment yeah. issue somewhere. Yeah, yeah the soundboard, sure. but we'll look into it. Right, I mean, right, where you were there, I, similar. Yeah, it was a challenge at times. It was a challenge at times, yeah. And, it, and I don't want it to be like, we spent the money to redo it. I really want it to be like yeah. loud for that place because yep. they did such a good job. So mm -hmm. these, maybe I'll hold part of that. But it was great. Any other comments? I also attended the um the play. I thought it was phenomenal. I was laughing out loud at several several parts. Um and poor Mr. Nelson was sitting in front of me. <laughs> and I kept on saying, like, do you see that hole in the curtain there? <laughs> and he's like, I picked up the swatches. And so it's like really great that we're getting new curtains because now all I see are the holes. They're coming April 5th. The, all right. the curtains come down literally. <laughs> My, poor Mr. Nelson. You can take a piece if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? Make suits to jump in the pool with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But the play was wonderful, really, really wonderful, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. So thank you to everyone who was involved. Um, next, we have comments from citizens. The Board of Education will recognize citizens of Middlebury and Southbury. The citizens are asked to state their name, their town of residence, and to limit their comments to three minutes. In accordance with Region 15 Board of Education Bylaw 9325A, speakers are asked to express themselves in a civil manner with due respect for the dignity and privacy of others who may be affected by their comments. While it is not the board's intent to stifle public comments, speakers should be aware that if their statements violate the rights of others under the law of defamation or invasion of privacy, the speaker, speaker may be held legally responsible. And we definitely appreciate hearing from members of the public. And while the board cannot respond to any public comment, we are listening and we do appreciate people talking and expressing their opinions. So, and if also when you get up to the stand, if you could write your name down so that it's an accurate um, spelling for the record, that would be wonderful. Jeff is not on there. Well, most of you know me, I'm um, Wendy Redfrey from Middlebury, and um, I have watched the budget presentation at home. I couldn't attend the past two Wednesdays, but I have watched them um, and took some notes. And I do understand that a lot of the board members have some concerns with the high number this year. Um, I do, as a you know, parent, sending your kid off to college next year, I think they're expensive. I mean, everywhere you go, everything costs a lot more money than it used to. But I do support this budget um, that Superintendent Smith has put out, um, realizing that it would be under 5% if the state fulfilled their obligation to us. So I think we need to really look at that piece of it, that it would be under 5% if we were getting those funds. Um, some of the line items that really stick out to me are the, um, the athletic stuff with the softball and baseball field. I have a senior, she's graduating, it's not going to affect her anymore. But she has played four wonderful starting a fourth year um, playing on that softball field and 
who my greatest memories are going to pop are going to be on that field. So I would love to see the enhancements for these younger players coming up. Um, she's playing in college. She, you know, she did it. So um, I would love to have that opportunity. And let me tell you, the scorebooks do not work. If it's hot, you don't know if they're flashing. You know, luckily we have game changers so we can kind of see where we are in the game. Um, so those are a definite key. And um, I really don't see anywhere where you could make some adjustments. I said, Ms. Rogers, I know you said maybe pulling little pieces from here and there, um, you know, to get to the kind of numbers that I think some people want. You're talking six, seven figure reduction. And I don't see where that can come from this budget. Um, I worked with Mr. Smith over the years to advisory, and he's always been very transparent and open. And I trust what he says, and I know um, that he has the best interest for our community at heart. Um, like I said, we have two girls, I have a freshman and a senior, a kindergarten, K 12, as I call them. And um, Region 15 did right by, especially my senior. My freshman needs 12 seniors, but she, you know, Elizabeth has had nothing but a wonderful education, and it's because we put the money in year after year after year to make sure that these students are getting what they need. So I hope you all will support the budget. Um, and like I always say, put it out to the voters. Let's see what the people say. Um, let's see what they have to come back with. Um, we have a referendum every year, and if it doesn't pass, we would go to a second one. But let's see what the voters have to say. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Leslie Donato. I'm a resident of Southbury, and I have children both at Rochambeau and at Palm Grove High School. And I just wanted to let everyone know I think we've done a really, really great job of putting together a really fair budget for this year. Um, I'm 100% supportive of it. Um, I do feel that most of the parents I'm talking to at both the middle school and elementary school are in support of the budget. I think everyone recognizes that costs are going up across the board. Um, this really does look like a maintenance good budget when you look into it. Um, I think people are really happy to see the capital improvements that are happening. Um, I think over the years, it's just been desperately, desperately needed. Uh, we had a lot of band-aids over a lot of big issues, and I do feel like people um, are happy to see that we are making investments. Um, it's not even just about the facilities and the people that use them. It's just about having pride in our schools um, and having people drive up to our campuses and say, wow, this is a really great place. We wish our school looked like this. Um, I would like to say, and I know you can't comment on this, but in COVID Wednesday with Middlebury and Southbury um, Finance Council are here. Um, I think one thing that we need to recognize um, as, as towns is that um, we do not have any type of um, MCA, YMCA, or like community facility. So I was on Cat Sports 12 years ago, and 12 years ago they knew that we needed a community center. They had known for 20 years that they needed this. So now it's been 30 plus years. We still don't have a community center. We don't have athletic fields that our programs can be on. It's not short fields. We have some, obviously, community house, and we have some parks that they can be at, but we don't have, we have one turf field in our town, and it is maxed out all the time. And for parents who have kids in sports, the schedule is a nightmare. <laughs> and you know, even the swimming pool, we have one indoor swimming pool in our, in our entire town. So people talk about you know, the expense or maybe complain of why is it so expensive. Everybody in our town are using our school facilities. Our youth basketball program is maxed out. That all takes place at all of our facilities. So I think it really need, does need to be a conversation with the town finance committees of how are we using our facilities? And if I, is the school charging for facilities? Because if we have to go to Newtown to use their facilities, we have to, you know, we get charged a fee. If you have to go to Riverview um, to use their playhouse, you get charged a huge fee. If you need to use a firehouse room, you get charged a huge fee. So anywhere else you go, um, there are fees that have to be paid to use facilities. And I, as far as I know, I don't think we are charging fees are not very high fees to use the facilities here. So again, I think that's a greater discussion and I hope um, that it does get addressed. I don't know if it will get addressed on Wednesday, um, but I'll probably also be coming to that meeting um, and have them really take a look at how our um, 
but I just want to commend you all and say thank you on the budget that you put forward. Thank you. Full support. Thank you. Ooh, perfect timing. This is the tomato. Thank you very much for your public comment. Um, next, we have on the agenda of budget discussion. Um, we're going to start this off with Mr. Smith answering um, some. Uh, I've tired myself. Oh, <laughs> you're up. Jeez. Um, we're going to start off with Mr. Smith answering questions um, that had been submitted by board members. And then once that's all set, we're going to have um, just a general board discussion, talking, getting a pulse of where everyone is and how we're going to move forward. Um, and Mr. Olson is no longer with us, but he did give me some something to read um, for his position, too. So um, we'll start off with Mr. Smith. He's just not on the call. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, he's no longer on the call. What did I say? Jeez. He's no longer with like, us in this meeting. Oh, these budgets get harder and harder. Yeah, worse. <laughs> that, take their toll. Oh, it's like a sex survivor gun. So I'll, I can spend more or less. Some of these, I'll zoom in so you can see this. So, um, but I can spend a little more time or less time on these questions. A lot of these questions, I feel like we've answered um, in other places. I also added like just a couple of ticklers in here that um, will remind us of things later on to come back to. Um, I'm gonna zoom in. Don't worry. Uh, there, there's, there's like so. I think we're up to 14 pages. Um, is this a document we'll get after this meeting? Or we'll yeah, so we'll put, we'll put this um, on the website as well. Okay. So you can see I have um, some in yellow and I have a couple. Of, we've covered most of these, like this view, so I apologize. I thought that was going to work. Um, so th those first set we covered before March 6th. Some of these are also from Board of Finance members that have come in that will be in Wednesday's conversation. Uh, but it got a little um, sticky in that some of your questions overlap with theirs. And so we dumped them all in this document and I'm happy to, again, send this to you. We'll post it on the website. Um, one question was on the, the uh, probability that, I didn't edit the questions by the way, so it's not really 740. Maybe we should kind of put a um, yeah, correction yeah. in that. But um, the likelihood, so Hartford knows about this problem. Um, it's a it's hundred million dollar fix. Um, and while they're sympathetic to it, I just don't know that they have levers that they can pull. So we're not going to know certainly before you have to vote on the budget. Um, so the uh, this is really um, for the finance one that we'll talk a little bit about, but the encumbrances by the end of the year. Um, this is asked a couple of different um, versions of this, um, but we haven't encumbered everything for the year yet. Um, Roman. So if you look at our enrollment report that's in your book, um, the, under each school it has a number. It's whether it's just the delta for that school. So all of our enrollment stuff is uh, linked there. Um, just want to clarify that the um, the two math coaches, one of them's in the budget, one's not. So there's only um, find funding for one of the math coaches. Um, people, I, I do have a, a sh short slideshow that I can pull up in a couple of minutes and show you some data comparisons. Um, there's some interesting conversation in there. Um, one's in the budget, one's covered by a grant. Correct. And that's We're that still getting two. Grant. Yes, we'll still have two, but all, the budget only funds one. Um, some revenue offsets. Um, this came from a couple of different places. So the board controls fees for pay to play, parking, and building use fees. Um, the other revenue that we collect isn't um, controllable by the board. Uh, that came from Board of Finance? Came from multiple places. Um, are we gonna talk, so I know you're going through this, but are we gonna talk about these like specifically, because we purposefully and deliberately lowered our fees to our students. I'm also an advocate and have been for the last year that we shouldn't be triple charging 
our town not-for-profit programs to use our schools for things like basketball or swimming, et cetera, et cetera. Because like all in those fees aren't enough, but we charge everyone all these money. So like, are we going to walk through each one of these? Because I think it would be disingenuous to sit here and say like, okay, we're going to lower the fees because we think it's unfair burden to kids to pay to park and then us to come back and say, well, now we're going to turn them back on. Like, I felt like we made the commitment to keep lowering it. I almost feel sure. like. Can I, can I just add a comment? Yeah. Because I think that this is also, I listened to the recording from last week and it was a purposeful question on how we could raise, and it was not for me, I was not here, how we could potentially raise revenue to offset the budget. And I think that to your point, I totally agree. It's a, it's a total dichotomy of where we were last year because this to me says this is exactly where we have opportunities to raise revenue and we heard for how many years that people had concerns over the facility fees and the pay-to-play fees so that's why I'm kind of in your camp saying at the end of the day the budget's the budget and how, what kind of revenue is the school district raising? and we're just shifting it exactly. right like it the money still needs to, to be paid right like because yeah. we heard conversations with kids like they're trying to work second yeah. jobs Right to get these parking, and it basically is taking and diversifying our student population even more for those that have to work a, a little bit harder. Or parents can't just say, "Okay, well, here's a parking spot," um, you know, and then other people can't afford it. Like, I actually appreciate I really that this answer has been in there because it totally addressed a comment that was raised last week in my mind. Because what kind of revenue are we talking about? At the end of the day, it still hits it's like ten thousand people, 10, it hits people like, in different ways. Exactly. That's like, a question further on. Okay. Right. So my thought is we're trying not to put a lot of um, what you do with this information is like the board's burden. There's not really a recommendation from us in any of this um, or any type of, unless you specifically ask for a cost analysis, we didn't do a cost analysis. So if people ask questions, we're trying to answer them, give people the information they need, and then you can wrestle with where we are. And, and so we're holding, I guess, right, the question, like, Marianne, like, on this, we're holding discussion, right, like, on the opportunities to increase revenue, or just waiting to see where people land, or, like, having that discussion now. The thing is, like, I, like, am I writing down, like, 37 points to argue against, or are we having them one at a time? I, I guess, I guess there's multiple opportunities to talk about it, right? Okay. I, I guess, like, if you want to talk about it now, we can. My guess is that this part is going to be part of a a bigger conversation so if it's part of a bigger conversation maybe we'll do it at the budget discussion which is you know, i'm trying either I, way I i'm, I'm against raising the record 24 for i've been on the board now what more than five five years right for the first four that's all i heard about <laughs> exactly. We're reducing so that's where my mind really i want to make sure it's very clear to the board when we talk about raising revenue what that impact is and if the impact is that we're revisiting conversations from four years ago, which is where I do not want to go. And so, commitments we made to the community. We sat here and we told the community that we were going, we, we did so much studies on what our parking and our student fees were versus districts. People brought all this in and we said, we're going to lower it. And like, I rewind it and we said, we were going to keep evaluating to make sure that we are not this crazy number. Maybe we'll lower it again. So I just want to make sure that when we say things here, Right, and we make commitments to the community that we uphold those not only in the next year but the year after that. There's other tough conversations to have. I think that's fine, but I want to make sure that we remember those conversations that we had with the community, right, and make sure that we're continuing to uphold them because that's how we keep people's trust, and that's that's really important. So, uh, if they're in a presentation already, uh, we try to reference it. So most of these things were in the um, athletic presentation. Um, here's the answer to your question. Uh, this is what we've collected. Now, the hard part of this is that before the 21-22 budget, we didn't break out revenue. And remember, you had um, just really the, the we net. We net budgeted. So you, you didn't know where the revenue was. It wasn't tracked this way. Uh, so currently in this year's budget, uh, we budgeted 10000 Partly because I don't feel we have enough data, and I mean, it's the twenty thousand dollars, the risk uh, versus the revenue. But um, as as Joe and I kind of talk through this again, like we could, uh, you you could estimate another, you know, ten. I'd be hesitant to to go up too close to this because again, we just started. Um, and then the, the other piece that's in this number is 
it's driven a lot by um, the, like the oh, number of custodians and the salary rates of those custodians that we move on that, um, and how we, we bill it out. Um, we do not absorb any of the custodians' fees, but the delta between where the, the number of hours, number of custodians, and kind of our uh, revenue margin shift a little bit. So this is pretty new to the district, and we don't have more than three years. So that's why we haven't really, um, and in a $90 million budget, you know, the, the 20000 or 10000 more in revenue doesn't really move the decimal. And we also do struggle with not related uh, the typical firm, especially, and we do a projection on that, and that is very erratic because as numbers go up, we have less typical firm, less tuition that comes in there. So the revenue side, um, those are kind of the two big pieces that kind of flip flop. Um, revenue has been pretty stable, at least on the the rental side, but we do have an offset, as Josh said. There, there is a there's a wide gap in custodial rates for any case. If you kind of go against the top salary, which is fair because we don't want to mess and lose money on 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 that hourly. Um, so that's something we have to think about. So, so that line item is tuition on typical care. No, that's, and I'm, I'm, I'm mudding the water. That, okay. that's, just, that's just rent. Just, that's just rent. So, rent. Okay. so when Joe talks about, so there's, we have pay to play revenue, you have the tuition, preschool revenue, and you have facilities revenue. So if you roll those three together, our numbers are pretty close because yeah. while we're like $10,000 maybe light in our budgeting here, we, we didn't make yeah. as much in pay-to-play pay -play pay -play play. So on, but... like In our minds, we don't necessarily break these three out into like micro-slicing like this. We would look at revenue we take in from the programs. And if you look at that on a three-year average, it's pretty accurate. So but when you slice it, you could reduce the revenue in pay-to-play by 10000 and increase the revenue in facilities by 10000 yeah. Um That wasn't really an analysis on how we looked at this before. Um, enrollment, someone asked about uh, how many students from eighth grade go to schools other than high school. Uh, so before we centralized registration, which we did, we did the year of COVID. Um, so we didn't really track this, like the secretary in the school might have a note of where the child was going, but it wasn't systematized. So this is um, the Votex and technical schools. We have very good accounting because we can get it from the state. Where students go, if they go to a school other than that, you have to get it from the parents when they withdraw their eighth grader. So we have, um, last year we have 11 students that chose to go to, a, basically it's a private high school, um, Westover, um, Sacred Heart, um, and uh, Chester Academy, one that went to Cho, one that went to the Gunnery, um, a total of 11, um, where, you know, on average, about 24% of our students, eighth graders, go to um, non log or technical high school. But that's been pretty stable. We have this little spike here. The question was really about adjusting staff, um, and it really has no impact on staff here. It might, it might, like a teacher might teach an extra section for a freshman class um, or a less section of a freshman, but it doesn't change the overall teaching structure. There's um, there, the substitute line, I feel like we've talked about it a couple of times. Um, we increased sub rates um, a couple of different ways. We added a, a, a lane for teachers that retired from here. We added a certified, we upped the certified line for a long-term sub, which is helped by the way with our sub rates, but we voted on that here that had an impact. And then the other piece is that was part of the ESSER grant that subsidized that. Um, this we, we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, teachers don't have the ability to override any account. Um, I'm going to talk about the return on investment, which is like an interesting experiment for me. So I uh, appreciate the question. Uh, I'm not sure the answer will, will kind of um, scratch the, the itch that you have, but um, I think it's an interesting conversation. Uh, the, the grant program. So the Title I funds had a couple of different things in there. We had um, that teacher residency group, uh, program. That's the state program to help uh, attract new teachers. Um, What's been helpful with that is as that program's grown, they now have more state and federal money, so the cost of districts has gone down. Um, and as we uh, kind of get more mature in our math instruction, we've had some consulting in there, uh, both for math and literacy, that we've been able to do some gradual release. So as we are able to um, exit those funds, um, we can bring in that math coach into that Title I. 
Um, and really, when we met with principals and teachers, um, elementary principals, and, and that was the one thing that they said, if we can't have anything else in the, in the budget, that's where we want to go. And I, I put it in here, I don't know if it's in this one or not, uh, there were two elementary reductions um, in the budget. So there is like an offset for this. This isn't a full FTE ad. There was some um, staffing we reduced. Again, that staffing though wasn't directly so we could bring this coach in. It was enrollment driven, but it does give you salary savings um, that we can do that. And we didn't bring in literacy coaches because we have a literacy coach at each elementary school. Um, so I broke down uh, the math coaches and the coaches district wide. Uh, we talked about um, pay to play and revenue. Again, total offset to the budget. Um, culinary room, they met tonight actually, so I haven't talked to anybody about how that went, but um, they're going to do a site visit soon and we'll start to have some um, more formal costing and I think a phased in approach um, to how we can fund that. Um, so but that's not part yeah. of the budget, right? That's the bond money, right? right? So, so, so there's some, like this is, um, these are the questions that members, so some of these questions kind of, um, I don't, I don't know that I would define them as pure budget questions, but they are probably part of the financial questions that board members are getting in the community. So again, I'm trying not to make a value judgment on the questions. If you're asking them or the board of finance is asking them, then they're, you're thinking about them. Um, and if they relate to how we fund things in the district, or if we're going to move things like from the operating capital, uh, like they they may interact somewhere. And I, I guess I, I asked that like publicly, right? Because it's like, while we have separate things going on, I don't want to muddy the water. Like if we get rid of the culinary program, that's not changing the budget. Right, like we say, nope, we're not doing that anymore. Hands down, we're leaving it as is. Right, that's money that we're utilizing to make those upgrades from the bond. Right, which has nothing to do. There with is a this staffing year. position. A staffing that, position. So that could be. Uh, again, I don't. I, I I'm trying to answer them. But it's not like this magic seven hundred thousand dollar number that everyone's looking for. Correct. Could you just roll up? The yep. Let's move past the coaching one. Oh, uh, sorry. Thirty six. Oh. So we have one reading coach, four, two in the elementary. There's a middle school math coach and then a language arts coach. Is that district or is that? Uh, middle school. So I'm sorry, middle school okay. math and middle school language arts. Okay. And then we have a teacher in residence. Yeah. So I, I don't know that that's a pure coach role. Like that, there's um, some of her work is with adults. So, so when we talk about instructional coaches, 100% of their time is about teacher instruction. Um, so when we then the teacher in residency different than the TRP person that that's funded through the uh, partially through state and through our grant, um, the our teacher in residency we work on um, cultural competency diversity. Some of her work is with like in a coaching role, but um, some of her work may be in curriculum role. There might be grant work there. She worked with equity and inclusion. It's not um, it's not as like clean as a coach I would say. Um, it, maybe there's a Venn diagram for her. Yeah. Okay. Um, some of the question, um, so when we build the budget out, we talk about where students are going to go. Um, right now, there's really not a position. If, if a principal said, you know, here's a position, I'm not really sure we need it, but we're going to budget for it anyway. Like, that's not really how we operate. We start with what do we need, and, um, and that's how those two elementary positions were, were removed. Um, try to reference other questions because this is where they started overlapping. Um, I don't want to, I want to respect the questions people are asking, but um, if there, there's overlap, um, the timeline, again, not directly a budget question, but I know that people are asking some questions around. There's a question about um, are we going to fix a school? Um, if something breaks at GES, like we're not going to just leave it, like a window breaks, we're going to replace it. If a boiler breaks, we'll repair it. Like we're not going to leave that school um, or BES kind of um, to their own until this is all done. Um, and then the one piece here, um, what the, the potential impact is a little hard for us to look at. Uh, but in this year's proposed budget, we are talking about increase, starting a process of increasing our bond debt. Whatever project we decide to do is most likely going to be bonded. We anticipate having um, about 1.6 million um, 
asking Mr. Martino to like give me the, the thumbs up. So I'll, I'll talk slow while he comes back. But um, we anticipate that line will, will heal to about 1.6 million, of which about 600,000 will go for the bond that we currently have. Um, we're working on some um, potential cost scenarios. There's a lot of moving parts. You're talking two to three years out. What's the bond rate going to be? What's our reimbursement rate going to be from the state? But if you're talking about um, like a $50 million bond, uh, which would be a $100 million school reimbursed at 50%. Um, and again, don't quote me on it. This is like working math, right? Um, but potentially, and bond rates right now, I think we're looking at 5%, 3.5%, 4 or something like that. So um, we're, we're, and this isn't going to be my math. We're talking like Barry will do some yeah. scenarios for us and Glenn. But, you know, you're talking about a potential bond payment of, you know, 25 or, or $3 million for a 30-year bond. And so if we have $1 million in the budget, then that $2 million is going to hit the budget increase. If you build that over time and we have a million and a half, three million, whatever that is, it just smooths the impact when you do a project. Again, a lot of moving parts. How much is the school? What's our reimbursement rate going to be? Um, can we pay down just like we're doing now with that? Hopefully the, the air conditioning grant, what that will do is allow us to borrow less money, which will create more in that debt service line that we can then apply to other uh, bond debt. So I want it out there so that you have it, not directly related to this budget, but the reason we're trying to add to that bond debt line is so that we can reduce the impact three or four years from now um, and kind of smooth that. $100,000 doesn't move your budget all that much, um, but a million dollars does. Although, to be fair, there's a price to that. Right? Every Everything you're paying for it now, right? So. Yeah. If you're smoothing that gradually a hundred grand every year, that's a hundred this year, that's two hundred next year, that's yeah. three hundred dollars a year. All of a sudden that's six hundred grand to avoid the sticker shock, but that's not like it's not a freebie. No, no, <laughs> right? like that's and it's not gonna sit there either. Though. So right. like that might be, and again, I, this is a board, board conversation, but that might be fixing air conditioning units while yeah. we're kind of building that lineup. It yeah. may be the turf field that's gonna be replaced in two years. Yeah. Um, it may be a second turf, like we have plenty of places that we can go um, so that that money, the, the purpose of that isn't just to do some project three years from now. Mm -hmm. but, but again, this is, I want to put it out there so yeah. that we can have an informed conversation. We, we could, I mean, yeah. we could, we could absorb the, um, the bond um, debt service as it comes off and buy down your, your annual increase. But then again, it, it's going to come back somewhere. Yeah. Right. So um, th this is more about a philosophy about how we uh, build a budget and, and manage it over time. What um, and, and honestly, even if we wanted to reduce it now, I'd like people to not be surprised. In some other districts that, that haven't done this, they build um, a renovation or a school and you would have like a 9% spike and everybody yeah. freaks out. Yeah. So if we choose to do that, that's fine. But I want to like manage. Yeah. Eyes wide open. I was going to say, people will laugh if my administrators are, are um, I'm, but I like to manage expectations, sure. you know, and uh, surprises are not good for anybody. And so I probably say that more than I need to, but um, I, I want to be transparent and say, here are the choices. Like, I think Joe and I are rational people, um, but I'm, I'm not like some kind of brilliant genius. Like here, you guys can, can wrestle and, and decide how we want to manage this. I don't want to go back to a place um, that, that we inherited a little bit where we didn't have a plan to fix stuff. If we have a plan and we choose to adapt it or whatever, that's fine, but it should be all of our plans so that whoever's not here um, understands how we got there and, and what we're doing. Um, and this is a couple of different ways about the unencumbered balance um, and, and how we spend that and, and what's there. Um, between now and the end of the year. So one of the things that um, the debt service placeholder that we currently have in the budget. Um, April 10th, I think, is when we issue the bond. Um, right. Well, 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 we'll know our official payment. So, yeah, we'll know what that payment and how much of it we're going to use this year. And then that number will become clear by like mid April. Um, you also have the excess cost, the final excess cost, then officially, probably by May, April, May. And then we'll know if Hartford is able to move that. The 68 percent is what we're anticipating now. That's creating that six hundred thousand dollar hole. We're hoping the hole is 68. That's yeah, right. right. Like, we're hoping to at least it doesn't get any hole. Hole in the hole is 68. Yeah, big, big old wallet. 
Um, and there's the bond question, grant reimbursements. Uh, so the HVAC grant, again, this is a matching grant. Um, so if we get it, um, the money for the matching piece will come out of the, um, the bond, but then it will basically just reduce the amount that we bought. We can't then reinvest that. That's not how, we don't have that option. Uh, but it means that we'll save money in our debt service line. Um, so this one, I have, I took a picture tonight. I, I need to build just some slides, um, but basically some questions that, that about staffing over time. So the, the short answer is, if you go back to every budget presentation um, from 2023 to today, almost all of those budget, all those staffing positions are accounted for in there with the rationale of why they're here. They were all approved by the board. They were all approved at referendum. So there's a clear path. You get into some fractional pieces um, where we have staff that are in multiple buildings. And so I need to tie out where some of that staffing goes, um, which I appreciate that we now have an HR department that can, can one and a half, but they're able to help me. Um, and then I, I'll say this often, there's not a direct correlation between the number of students in the staff and, and the staff. As you saw, like we went down in students, but we're adding an ML teacher because we have more multilingual students um, that is independent of the number of overall students. Our special education numbers change independent of the actual number of enrollment. So you can't tie, and even the, the 116 students, that's over seven schools and really 14 grades when you think preschool to age 22. So like there is no direct correlation um, into those two numbers. Is there any scenario where it ever goes down? We, we're, we're cutting two this year. But you're adding five and a half on top of it, so. Four and a half. Well, one is grant funded, but it's a new oh, position we're creating. Yep, okay. And we're picking up two from the year before. So yep. maybe the two from yeah. the year before wash out the two you're eliminated. Yeah. Well, yeah. So you have yeah. five and a half yeah. new positions yeah. you're creating. So if you go through that same scenario with the- Walk through the five and a half. Two math coaches, a yeah. special education teacher, half a music teacher, a culinary teacher, and an ML teacher. Yeah. That's five and a half new positions that don't exist currently. Yes. Now we're losing two on the elementary school, but actually our average class size in elementary is as low as it's been in five years, even without a reduction of two teachers. So, so like that's where like that enrollment correlation. Right. So the other ones are expanding programs. Right. So but there, there's a, with, yeah. with the exception of, I would, well, I guess technically, I would argue that the ML one really isn't discretionary because we're, we're meeting minimums, but, but technically I think it could be. So, I mean, I think that's why I put them in there and then you guys can just like, we don't have to expand the culinary program, that's a choice. The special ed teacher and the ML teacher, I would argue are less discretionary because there's mandated services we have to um, respond to, but really the others are discretionary. I have to say, this is where I, I really struggle because culinary is part of the bond. We heard year over year, time and time again, this is a high demand class, the highest in the department. Well, the pull through is it, it's, it's, you know, it's economics, you know, supply and demand. If we, we're going to redo the facility, that's great. But if we're also talking about managing expectations relative to be, to having people actually be able to take it, I would expect that there would be more offering. And the direct piece would be we'd need to have increased instruction. So I think we, we have to be very clear in our messaging, going back, I think, to what you were saying earlier, Shannon, if we're endorsing some of these things, we'd like to see a positive impact. I'd like to see a, a bigger tennis team once we get new tennis courts. That's a nice problem to have. And I just am struggling that we're talking about modifying or decreasing a proposed budget to offer more culinary when we've heard year over year that that is the highest demand and we're modifying the culinary room. So I feel like there's this oscillation that's happening because we're now seeing, well, there's an impact to that. And yeah, there is, because there is a high demand for it and we're, we're doing everything to support that demand, which includes providing additional instruction. So I, I'm really struggling with any level of instructional decrease, 100%. I heard that last week in the recording. I'm kind of hearing it in these questions. I, I, it's very concerning to me that the number is the number. It's the fair number. I'm sorry, Mary, I'm getting into the discussion now, but 
this is what the administrative field is needed to run the school. I'm not hearing any concerns from the community over the, the this budget. I'm not. I hear about the attendance policy. I hear about the facilities. I hear about the status of our projects. I hear that people are actually happy. I'm not discounting that it's not a high budget, but at the end of the day, what are what are we gaining from these these conversations over these minuscule cuts? It, it makes absolutely no sense to me. I'm sorry. And I just want to piggyback, right? Because that's the thing. We're making conscious choices. We're saying culinary is important, right? So then we're putting this program in. But we're also saying when Josh went over the scores, right, and math, right, in our middle schools were lower than our districts around us, right? We said we need to do more in math. So, and the elementary students, the principals, the teachers are coming and saying, we need to not, these math coaches are great, but I need one full time for my school to help my teachers to be there. And then we're sitting here saying, well, maybe we don't need the math coaches, but we want the scores to improve. So like, it, it, there are through lines, right? Every decision that we make here, if we're sitting here and we all sat here and said, we need those scores, Josh, you gotta make those scores improve. And they're like, okay, how do we do this? They looked at the program, they evaluated, we need math coaches, let's bring them in. All schools that are doing very well, right? The number one thing I'm hearing is math coaches. I have not heard a single person complain about this budget. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot about attendance policy, same thing, right? I like, but the math coaches, that's the number one thing people are saying. I'm so glad you're finally doing that. So like, right, so to me, like you take ML out, you take the math coaches out, you got to take culinary out. We're talking about one position maybe, and we're dropping two and a half. So I just think when we make decisions here on programming that we have to understand that's going to come with the support systems in it. And this is compared to every other region around us. This is not a high budget. Mm -hmm. I disagree. I disagree with that too. Yeah. I think, I think that's actually the opposite. Like, yeah. I don't think it's. I, I think I can bring up a spreadsheet and show you exactly yeah, that you are. But I think we have to be careful when we're. Uh, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I'm just saying we need to be careful. I, uh, and we cannot say our budget fair. number is blah in comparison to blah. That's and, it's, fair. And, and also, we can't say that the coaches, that is not. That is, I agree with you that the coaches support what we have been asking for, but there's not, I don't think you can look at other towns and go, this one has a coach and this one has a coach. These are the coaching models that are used. So we specifically asked that and we were told, no, we, I believe that that's not either we, either there's not a coaching, this similar model is not in place at other schools or we don't know. But that's almost like yeah. saying that we can't compare yeah. growth and, and assessments with yeah. other schools. I hear you, Steve, yeah. and I would agree, yes. like we need to look yeah. like at the spreadsheet of the numbers. I'm not gonna challenge that. That's not my wheelhouse of expertise, but I will go back to say, what do we need to run an effective school system? What do our children need? What do our teachers need? If this is what the budget is coming up with, I'm not seeing a lot of that in this. I'm not convinced that cutting instruction is the route, and I don't think that's good for our, our, our schools, our teachers, and everything that basically, in my opinion, we are trying to overcome from a decade ago. I wasn't on the board a decade ago. I, I voted in favor of every school budget that I was able to vote on. I wasn't part of a zero budget. I wasn't part of a 1% budget, a 2% budget. We are still reeling the consequence of those decisions from 10 years ago. And some of you were on the, the board at that time. I don't know that I know there's extensive challenges that were happening at that time, but the reality is the consequence of those decisions has been compounded by things that no one ever, ever, ever fathomed, right? COVID, inflation, overall price of things. I know this number is high, but I sit there and say, Milk is high. Everything is high. And I know at some point the, the purse and the wallets are empty, but this and our education is not a place to cut it. And so I, I just feel that this is a little bit of a perfect storm, but if we continue to kick it down and cut and cut, it is going to be compounded. We heard even, you know, when you're thinking about like a 9%, I know that was an example, we're talking about six and people are upset about it. Imagine if, if we don't invest in these things and people see a nine or a 10. I think that's speculation. It you, is. You could, you could also just say, 
why am I going to give you a new school? You've had these run ups in the budget now, two, three, four the years. Schools are going to fall apart. Six, 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 six. And then it's going to be a crisis it, situation. Well, and sometimes a crisis gets a 9%. So, I, I, again, I'm not, I, I'm just saying we, I, we can't speculate out what someone might That's do. That's fair, but we can yeah. look at the past and see how yes. it's impacting our current situation. And I do not want to be in a situation where we're continuing to cut a budget only to further contribute to a legacy issue, frankly. I'm sorry. I just see people on page four of 10 questions. <laughs> and I'm just wondering if we should refocus back on this and then get a yeah. Um, I will just jump in though to say, and I mentioned this last week you were in here, um, Sharon, but I'm very sensitive as we're talking about possible reductions to this proposal to using the word cut. Because a cut to me says, you know, there's five and there's what, four point two million new dollars being requested here that we don't have today. That cut to me is taking away something we currently have. Um I think it's fair, like when you bring up zero budgets, that was actually cut saying you have this many teachers, we have to take away five because we have inflationary measures and we can't afford to be zero, something has to give. I don't know, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I want to just be very clear when we say cut, that's not taking away positions we have necessarily. I it is taking away services from our children, that's a cut. Yeah, if we, if cut. we remove any of those 5.5 .5 positions, that's not a cut to me because it doesn't exist currently. It is a disagreement with the recommendation from the superintendent, but that word cut is, is loaded, especially when we use it in uh, reference to those 0% budgets where the cuts were real, where it's like, I'm taking this away from our students now. So, but then why are we doing a culinary room, right? Like we're spending half million dollars-ish. I don't know if the number is, I'm not on the committee. Uh -oh. Like whatever the number is, right? Then we should stop that completely and redeploy that to seats in the auditorium, right? Something else then, right? Because if we're going to sit here and have that conversation and say, well, we are going to start cutting programs, not including, that's a cut to me, right? We're going to say, okay, we're going to do this culinary program. It's the number one thing requested at our high school. We're no longer in investments. So you're not going to get the teacher. We can't put a new culinary room if we're not going to do the teacher. Then we need to redeploy that money. And I think a, that is a disservice to what our administrators are telling us that the children want. And the community voted for it, just putting it out. My comment was not in response to any individual thing, just that the word cut is being tossed around very freely, especially in conjunction with 0% budgets. And I think it's a vastly different situation. Wait, thank you. Okay, okay. now I got it. Yeah, Turn back all right. I was on push, but I'm, I'm gonna go back in. Um, I think when you say that we just cut the culinary project and you know give the money to seats, that's something we've been trying not to do because voters voted for that. So we're trying not to do that. But when you talk about culinary, and I believe early childhood education would be part of that, um, we have a teacher shortage. We also do a lot here for AP classes. We do a lot for athletics. We do a lot for a lot of things. It is a smaller area, but it's a pathway to furthering someone's education or to giving them an opportunity to see if they want to go into that. So it is such a requested class and area. I don't have a problem with that position, um, especially in light of the fact that there's a wait list for kids to get into um, to that class. So to me, that would be something that, I mean, newsflash, I'll probably be in favor of it, but I think it's because we do support kids in so many other areas it would be a shame to have passed that in the bond, be working on it, um, and not utilize that space and give kids more opportunities. Um, so that was just one. That was banging. I'm off. for the culinary. Yeah. Like, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not for it, I, but I'm, my I vote know. is for it. I know, right? Like, like, I think like when we were yeah. getting kind of in the thick of it there. Yeah. And I want well, to make we, sure that we are spending yeah. money, right? This the whole time I've sat on this board. The same thing with the bathrooms, right? That became the same. Why do you vote for bathrooms? There's a lot of pushback about that at the LMA, at the LMES portables. If we're gonna do something, we need to do it right. Right? Like I'm not in favor of half doing things or partially doing things. We make a decision as a board, we stand by and do it right. If we're gonna do the culinary room, we're gonna staff the culinary room. 
I'm not for the client room, but I'm gonna vote yes for it because that's what the students want. It's not my personal preference, but this isn't about me. This is about the community and what they want. So that's why I'm voicing my opinion about it, right? Because I'm an elected official to sit here to reflect my community, not my own personal preference. So I'm yes for the client. Yeah. I didn't want yeah, to. Yeah, no, I, know, I knew you could. That's not what you meant. Okay. Like, I just want to say, since we were getting the thick yeah. of it, um, I guess that's it for now. At what point does it, since you said it, at yeah. what point does it stop in the sense that mm -hmm. if, if everyone, yes, okay, everyone wants to take culinary, like, is there something that someone doesn't want to take that should that, should, should that then be cut? Whatever that is. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, because you, you can't, I don't know if, I mean, you probably watched last week, but if the budget was seven or eight or nine percent, like at some point you have to go as much as I, I want this and it is a reflection of our, our strategies, like it simply is too high. So I think it is it's very easy to have an additive discussion about, well, we need to add this, we need to add this, we need to add this to support. And I think in at a six percent, we abnegate our duty a bit when we don't ask the tougher questions about what possibly might we cut in order to be able to fund uh, the, the classes that the kids kids want. It's a 5.83%. Sorry. Yeah. There's a big will, difference will, between 5.83 and 6%. Sorry. All right. 5.83. And, and there's nothing to that cut, cut right? Well, to to go back to what he said, he's not, it's not cut. It's not add or it's, you know, we've but got I this struggle with, with this because a couple meetings ago, there was a question on the table where it said, well, we didn't, there wasn't a, a realization that this would, in, would result in an increased teacher, right? I think you asked the time, you yeah. had the question. Mm -hmm. To me, and, and maybe I made the alternate assumption because I'm thinking we're, we're redoing the culinary room. We don't have enough demand, I heard that perhaps, you know, this would, you know, get freshmen and I'm sitting there saying, let's just level set expectations and let's try and get seniors and juniors in, right? So I'm sitting here saying, of course we would expect that there would be additional need for, because how can one teacher that's right. already teaching the most right. popular class be able no, to I instruct? I completely disagree. I saw the exact opposite. There's one teacher, the teacher teaches five sections. I don't care if you have, you redo the kitchen, don't redo it. There's still one teacher teaching five sections. But then we can't be talking about kids can't get into the class. They, they, they can't, they haven't been able to get into it for 10 years and we didn't redo the kitchen. So redoing the kitchen no, does I agree, but, that, didn't add but then demand yes. for the class yeah. goes out the window, right? right? It's not, okay, it's filled. We're gonna up yeah, the class. It's a life yeah, skill. I'm for the culinary. Yeah. I think that this is something that speaks to what I resonate with what Shannon's saying, you know, we are moving forward on certain initiatives, but we're looking for opportunities to cut. I hear you, Steve. I know it's a big number, but you also know the consequence of the number being too low, right? And I, before I sit here and speculate and say, what could, could we cut now? I would rather say, let it go to the community. And if it doesn't pass, then we have some significant conversations, which I'm sure Joe and Josh are already talking about and see what where that would be. I, I just don't know why we are at this place of trying to just trim in places where to me it comes into instruction. And that's what I picked up from last week when I watched that tape. It sounded like that there were people in this room that wanted to cut instruction. And I struggle with that wholeheartedly, whether it's class size, whether it's the different variables, the complexity, special ed or um, the need for um, uh, structured learning and individual learning, those are all nuanced levels of education that didn't exist 20 years ago and 30 years ago. So that does take more time. That does take more teachers. So I, I actually am I'm struggling to understand where we think we can cut and still actually continue to at least keep our schools somewhat good. Are you guys hearing from the community? No. Like, no, no. I've not heard either way. Oh, you've not heard either way. Have you heard that I people have, feel? I've heard some things. Okay. So that's what, because that's what I like, want to use that as. Try to, yeah, yeah. But yeah. that's our job. I mean, like, our, our job, like, right? So we are here on behalf of people, right? Because I have not heard, and maybe this is really whatever, but I was at a breakfast with Ed St. John on Saturday morning, and he told me, good to go, rock it through. 
great number. And the environmental inflationary pressure we are, we're like, I'm, I'm ready to go right now. Like, let's do it. And I think we should vote it early. I just, I don't know what we're talking about. I would, I mean, I would say if, if Ed St. John and, and the other Penn South, if they were all for it, that would, that would really impact. They were for it. Um, he said it in front of 12 people yes. and with that I was standing. But uh, I, if I heard it with my own ears. <laughs> but yeah. I'm um, going to record. <laughs> but I will say though that I've actively asked people that I know in this community, like, what are your thoughts? Crickets. I think my worry is that we, me personally, I lived through failed budgets here as a taxpayer, as a parent. Mm -hmm. um, part of that was apathy because budgets had passed for a while and it was apathy. So that's where I worry that our, have we passed so many that people are apathetic and this happens to be a high year. Um, do we have a good finger on the, on the pulse of what's going on? And I wouldn't make a projection. I'd like to wait till we have the, um, the group here with us on Wednesday and see what they have to say. Um, and again, my question last week was, give us the numbers. What's this going to cost the average taxpayer? Like, I know that's a hard lot of math and whatever that they don't want to do, but is this going to cost people an extra $10 a year? Is it going to cost an extra $1,000 a year? That might sway how people think. Um, I don't know. But that to me is a part of the equation that we don't really get into. Can I just say though, so yeah. even if we could shave any. I don't right. know if that makes There's sense. always a bottom to the budget, right? Yes. Otherwise, it's as Tom is saying, it's excruciatingly painful bleeding, right? Mm -hmm. So at some point, even if it's, and I'm making this up, a thousand dollar, right? Shaving a 0 0.01 or a 0 0.02, that's going to have very minimal impact. But that's what I on want. The dollar that's amount. what I want here. Okay, that's. I mean. But that's what I want to hear. How is what's the impact going to be? But, the, but that's the, what we hear, in and that's fair. Like but we can't afford it. We can't afford it. Okay, but is it ten dollars or a thousand? But then you have to then be prepared to bleed the budget, because if people and I'm I'm not and I think it's fair to say what's that number and what's it going to cost me? A hundred percent. That's fair. But if you have it in your mind what your number should be, there is an impact, and then we're back ten years ago, and that would be devastating, right? So I think we have to also level set expectations. Everything does have a high cost. Mm -hmm. Prices have not dropped, even though inflation, I agree. I'm a little bit, you're the financial person, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, what are we here for? It's to educate our children and, and that adds value to our community. And I think everyone is committed to that. I just think we have to be very, very careful about what it is we truly need. And I would go so far to say, I think that not only is this fiscally responsible, I also think it's not as high as it could and should have been. So I think that it could be higher, right? As someone who has kids in the school system, I would want it to be higher. This is the budget that was presented. I feel very confident with the presentations and the amount of 42, or 42 questions or however many. <laughs> I'm good. I just, for me, I, I'm just conscientious of when we could potentially work to pass the budget. That's just a question I put out there. And I just want to, like, right, level set on top of that, because that's exactly it, right? Part of this shift that people are worried about, it's because the EDM swings our numbers so much that one town, right, gets a bigger impact essentially every year than another town because of the way we're shifting back and forth, right? So that's maybe a secondary conversation, right? We move the decimal point in. We try to smooth this out because then it pits the towns kind of against each other. Last year, Middlebury got a bigger percent of the number. This year, Southbury gets a bigger percent of the number. When in reality, right, we shouldn't be managing to the numbers. We should be managing to what I need. I'm with Sharon. I don't think this budget has enough for my kids, right? I think we could have done more for this community. I would have liked to see seats. There's a lot of things in this budget that my, my, my kids, my kids, middle school is asking for microphones, right? Because they don't have microphones to run a theater program, right? That to me is a miss on our part that I'm now donating money to a school program because they don't have what they need because we aren't giving them enough. So I don't they think ask for it. Did they what? ask for it and was it denied would be my first question. I don't know. Was it because we get asked a lot of things. And my first question is, did you ask for it and was it denied? That helps our conversation. 
but what I'm but what I'm saying, I know, right? Like, there's a lot more things that I think we could do, programs we could roll out, and like I would have been okay with a higher number. Everything is really expensive right now. Everything's really expensive. Everything's gonna get a little bit more expensive before it kind of drops down. That's the space we are in. Um, right. And, and things are kind of level setting off of all of those years of kind of free money. We, the budget's always going to go up. Things are never, there's never a time and space where it's like, oh, that got cheaper. Like nothing in life is going to get cheaper. Everything moves forward. Mm -hmm. So, right. I think we just kind of need to, like, we can't just say like, oh, it's going to be zero or it's going to be free. Right. Like there's things every time Joe sends an email like, for finance, I'm like stressed about a roof, a boiler, like tape on something this week, sure, just, right? Like catastrophic, you know, like, catastrophic every, every week. week. Oh, it's right? so and, and the thing Gym is, unit is expensive. That's I, definitely going to be expensive. This budget is just <laughs> very, like, it's not like, right? Like, right, because what's the alternative? Josh come in at nine and I'll say, we've got to get us to five, eight, and then we're at five, eight, right? So he's presenting something fair and then we're beating him up over programs where like, you need math coaches. We need a culinary room. And now we're like having these conversations about it. It's kind of like counterintuitive, right? Like, you know, we're so deciding to be transparent. It's not necessarily counterintuitive because we are, we make, you know, we know what we want and then we kind of don't see the price tag until now. Yeah. So Mary, I, Richard's I, trying to get his hand. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Can I ask you, please? Yes, go ahead. Okay. First thing I'm going to ask is I'm not interrupted by a Number two. I want to answer your questions. Number it was never a zero budget when reaching 15, as long as I can remember. And okay. I've been involved, I've been involved in town government since the 80s. There were times when the budget was voted down, but screwed up the town of Middlebury because the Middlebury budget is based on the school budget, of course. We had a very difficult time between the time it was failed, 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 then finally passed. I think it was in uh, the series of the early uh, 2000, when the budget was 1%. Anyway, it was voted on by the voters. Oh, there was zeros, I'm sorry. The, the voters, there were zeros, right. The voters fought Hold the, the budget down, not the Board of Finance, not the Board of Education. It was done by the voters. So if you present a budget that the voters are not happy with, they're going to hold it down, number one, the first time. Then they're going to come back and you're going to reduce it, and they're still not going to be happy. It becomes a cycle. And you keep getting people start getting upset. And the more upset they get, the more they vote negative. We, I've, I've been through it. I know it. That's the number one. So I just want to answer your question on that. I have some comments here dealing with the budget. The Board of Education is responsible to provide a quality education at affordable price. Most of Region 15 funding comes from property tax, a very regretful a very regressive tax. This is the latest list of tax sales in the town of Middlebury. The state on this is 3124 tax sales because the people can't afford to pay their tax. So they got to sell their house to the town house. I don't think I could vote for a budget that forces people out of their houses. I would rather see another budget presented by the administration that does not reflect a, a sizable increase. Region 15 has been, been decreasing in run, and as you saw by the figures up there. And it, all has, and it has an overabundance of staff, 639 staff, according to the records I looked up the last time uh, the superintendent gave us. 639 staff members, certified and non-certified, 
in Major 15. To put this in perspective, the number of students at Gainfield and Middlebury Elementary School totals only 657. We have almost as much employees as we have in two elementary schools. That's an awful lot of employees. The increase is over $10 million in the past two years. This is close to the Wilderberry budget of $13 million. Again, I'm asking the administration to review this budget and come back some way to reduce the increase. Attrition is one of the best ways to do it because nobody feels anything but that. Nobody feels like they're laid off or they're shifted jobs or something like that. There's other ways of reducing the budget. I don't want to mention them now because some people might feel I'm attacking them. But uh, I'm hoping the administration could find more ways to come in with a lower increase in this budget. That's it. Great. Thank you so much, Richard. I um, appreciate your comments. Um, I'm going to redirect to Mr. Smith. I know you still have still have questions that you have to answer. Or so that that was the, the, the that flavor was the last question for that we had geared up for tonight. I do have a little analysis of math coaching if you want to see that. Um, you have to share that and then move on. Or I think we can... how about if we we go back to what you wanted to do for the math coaches Thank and you. then we'll kind of go back to the. I think this discussion is really important. That's why I, I didn't want to stop it. I think there was some good stuff that was timely. Um, but Mr. Smith has worked really hard on answering these questions, so I want to give him his time too. Yeah, and if we could get those ahead of the Wednesday meeting, so we can maybe even do some homework and we don't have to wait for them to be read, that would be maybe ideal. Um, yes. In case, in case we're not able to get to them. Um, I can send them all to you. Um, and I can even send you some of the ones that are like in process. Like that's the, the, the problem is we have one document that we're adding to. So as the questions come in, but um, I, I can do that. Um, where this stuff? I'm going to show it this way. Um, apologies a little bit to those at home. So this does show up a little bit. So I tried to put some questions there. Um, some of these are again redundant, but these are now all really kind of in their own lane. Um, you guys know the questions better than most. Um, so one thing again, I, I've already talked to this a couple of times, it's really hard to take it. I was trying to think of a good analogy or metaphor. So here's the one I'm workshopping. Um, if you want to get healthy and you start running, and you go on a low carb diet and you eat more fruits and vegetables and you eat your bowl of Cheerios or Wheaties or whatever you're supposed to bring your cholesterol down. Uh, and, and then you, you, or you drink that stuff that Joe drinks, it's going to help him live to 100. Um, 105. And, then, and then you go back to the doctor and you're healthier. It's really hard to say which one of those things had which amount of impact. But, the, but together, they're all good things for all of us to do, um, except for maybe the juice that Joe drinks. Um, but so like that's kind of how like the work that we're doing here is one component of many other things. Um, so when we did comparisons, I just want to be again transparent and clear. I reached out to um, a number of districts that are similar to us based on um, where their demographics are. Um, and we built a series of comparisons. I didn't necessarily build like a it, was, it wasn't bias in um, a cherry pick districts. I didn't know what this data was, um, but it is kind of a, a random sampling. There's no specific uh, method to that. Um, lots of them have different coaching models. So we're trying to calibrate, like we look a little different than them. Um, some are bigger than us, some are smaller. There's a couple that have all their schools on one campus so that it's easier for them to travel. So I try to calibrate for some of that stuff. Um, and like I said, they weren't completely random, but there was no like trying to manipulate this. Um, these are the districts here on the left that I think backwards here. So on the left, 
that um, you can see, these are the districts that responded. I did ask a few more districts, but they're also in budget season, so I didn't necessarily get more responses. Um, I added Waterford in today. Um, so you'll see that everybody in this comparison set has some version of a coaching or instructional, like Avon, their curriculum specialists are a little different than our coaches, but some version of support. Um, Monroe doesn't have them, but they, uh, there were a couple of districts that have um, elementary administrators. So they have a K-5 like STEM math and science person and a, a K-5 literacy person, um, administrative positions. I tried to put the ratios in there um, for their kind of, uh, again, some of those are like K-2 schools. Um, so instead of having like, we're talking about our model of we'll one math coach in each elementary school, some have a math coach that does like primary K-2 and K-5 that they share between the schools. Again, geography plays a lot into that. Um, so that's kind of how um, the models break out a little bit. Um, I'm still gathering, I, like I said, I think through Fairfield and Oxford, some of this, this is what I was working on when I realized it was seven o'clock and I had to run over here. So I do have a little more data um, to put in for some of those. Uh, this is year to year data I'm gonna share with you. It, it's not cohort data. Um, it's a different type of analysis that I do think the data exists, but I haven't dug that far into it yet. Um, so this actually, so what I want, so here, here are all the districts, right? Um, what I want to do, and I apologize to my peers, I kind of want to scrub their names. So when you look at grade four, for example, because this isn't a comparison of us I'm not trying to call out any district. We're really looking for the impact of math coaches. So the reason you have this messy page here, um, the number with or the line with the numbers on it, that's us. Um, and so what you'll see is like the this is the COVID impact. This and that a lot of districts, it's really interesting that like um, this orange district actually went up a little bit in COVID, which is an interesting, um, when we started talking, again, these aren't cohort data, though. These are different kids of the year. Um, but you can see that, like, while there's some trends, there's not, like, an answer. And that's fourth grade. Here's third grade, which somehow this column got pushed in the lines um, to allow that. And, and there's um, our third grade data. Um, and what you'll see is, like, our COVID dip was pretty huge. Um, and again, there's lots of factors in here. It's changing demographics. It could be our ML population. It's not big enough to make that big of a piece. So I can't tell you, like, for example, the district um, below us started lower but didn't drop as much. Like, you, that, there's, there's more analysis that has to go into this. Um, that's the grade four. And then here's the grade five. Um, and so you'll see, like, we started kind of towards the top of this group, which there's some really high performing districts in that group. So our 17, 18 data, 18, 19 data is still pretty good. Um, I, I did joke that soon after I got here, we had COVID. So the reason for the decline isn't necessarily the superintendent that came at the time. Um, but uh, you'll, you'll see that some of that data is now trending up. And like the question that we have internally is how long until we get back to where we were in that uh, 18, 19, 17, 18 year. Um, but all the other variables are uh, moving as well. So um, I have another series of this where I took each of the individual schools and tracked like just their um, third and fourth grade, um, uh, sorry, just their district through grades three, four, and five. Um, again, I think like it's an interesting analysis question, but I don't think it's gonna give you like a clear, if you do this, this is gonna happen and it's gonna happen in two years or three years. Um, what's also interesting is I now have like 12 friends that we're going to talk about this data and like, what do you think some of the factors are? Um, and again, we know what that dip is. The question is, what are we doing to get out of that dip? And the world we're in today is different than that 17, 18 year. When you talk about preschool and the, the, the elementary experience that, that children had in this middle, um, that's what we're struggling to overcome as a nation, not just a group of people. So anyway. Um, that'll be posted. Um, I'll clean up some of those slides and get them out there. Um, and we'll put the questions online too. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I just, before we go start going around the table, there is one 
point I wanted to, to clarify that in doing the culinary upgrade, I remember hearing Dr. Jones talk about this when we did a tour of the culinary room. I can't remember if it was last year or this year, but by upgrading the culinary room, that was going to be able to expand the size of the class. So they're going to be able, just by doing the culinary room, it's going to be able to shift the groupings or something like that. So the added teacher was going to add even more students, not, you know, just if, if we don't do the culinary, it's going to then take away spots from students, hopefully, that would be enabled to take advantage of the culinary program, having not done the upgrade. Just want to make that clear. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Because I was not on the tour. Yeah. So, therefore, I did not have that, that information. Um, so, what you're saying, so it's taking over more room. Just, so there's, so essentially, you can have, well, obviously, you can have two people teaching at the same time. You're going to have two teachers. The, no, I think how they're doing it is that they're making the culinary, you could explain this better, but it's like it's an early childhood teacher and a culinary teacher, so it increases both sections offered, right? Currently, you have multiple pressures that keep that program from expanding. One is like the setup, the fact that they have kind of these old home ec stoves that's not conducive to kids working with computers. Changing just that will allow a few kids you know, I don't know if that's 10 or 25, but it's not, it, it's a few kids because each current section will hold a few more. So that's one um, lane. Currently, we have one teacher that teaches, um, and I might have this reverse, three sections of culinary and two, four sections of culinary and one section of early childhood. So we're limited in both of those. So if you added the teacher and you didn't add the, um, the extra space, then you would still offer more sections. Third, the room that we have abuts a storage room that we're going to knock the wall out and make the space bigger. So you can offer more sections to more kids and not take away, you can actually add to the early childhood program as well. Um, so, and that, those, how many, currently the certification to teach both of those is the same. So we'd have the ability to ebb and flow between those two programs with those two teachers. So if one year it was 12 sections of culinary, I get my math right, and eight sections of early childhood, um, two, no, it's be, sorry, it's five sections per teacher. So my math has to add up to 10. But whatever permutation of the 10, um, it, can, it can ebb and flow um, between those sections. So we, and right now, when I think the high school had this in their presentation, these students are coming from study hall. They're not coming from so to your question around like, like when's enough enough. So when we have the courses, and it doesn't have to be a hundred percent, but when most students are able to get courses that they need to graduate or that they're interested in, and they're not in a study hall that they didn't choose to be in, that's when I would say a comprehensive high school has enough programming to meet the needs of their students. But it's not like a year and a date. It's going to be based on demand, and there may be times, and this has happened. I, I don't have the knowledge in my head. But my guess is there was times where we offered other electives or programs that we've sunset and we've introduced new ones. So that's not always a just add. You know, it's really driven by student interest and um, our capacity to offer courses that they need. And sometimes it's driven by mandates. I'm thinking of some of the, the courses that we now, the personal finance mandate that's coming from the state that they did offer, they, they softened the certification requirements. So that's going to have it's going to allow us more flexibility to have the staff that and not necessarily result in staffing increase. All right, so we can. Um... No more questions. I thought you were on like page 14. <laughs> um, the, 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 the next batch of questions would be Wednesday. Oh, that was nice. Okay. So, um, what I'd like to do is go around the room and get a, a feel for where people are. On the budget and whether you know you generally want to go down if so how much if you want to do good where we are if you want to go up if so how much um just to kind of get a pulse of where everyone is at um and one objective that i would like tonight is that if there's any further information that board members need to have 
that we were we would ask Mr. Smith or Mr. Martino to put together for us. Like, I'd like to leave here tonight with giving them that information, um, so that we can make Wednesday productive because we'll have um, another budget workshop on Wednesday, and then um, our next regular meeting would be or our next main board of ed meeting would be our budget vote. So, um, I do have um. Mr. Olson had to leave the meeting for work reasons, and he did um, send me something that he wanted me to read um, to the rest of the board um, that he had, he had to leave for a work meeting. And he says that my position on the budget, um, I feel that the budget was responsibly prepared with a keen attention to necessary spending and earnest effort to mitigate rising costs in areas beyond our control. Upon review and discussion, I don't believe there are are areas within the budget that represent wasteful spending or inordinate allocation of resources. In fact, very little can be considered negotiable when analyzing closely. I am in support of the budget as presented and feel there is no need for increase nor a need to decrease what has been presented. Thank you. So we'll start with Tom and then just kind of go around. Sure. Um, actually, can I go later? I'd like to compose my thoughts. Do I have to go now? Okay. No, I'll you can go on. later. I wasn't planning on going first. Yeah. Go ahead, Richard. Let's put it this way. If we keep the same dollar amount this year, we'll have an increase in the budget plus per student. That's okay. lost almost 4% of our students. So I'm going to say if the budget, is, if the administration comes back with a budget, that it's the same dollar amount as this current year, I will support it. Otherwise, I will not support any increase in dollar amounts. Okay, so you want a 0% increase. 0% yeah. increase in dollar. Okay, 0%. Which increase. means an increase per student, cost per student. Okay, all right. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Sally. Um, so I support the budget as the presented. I think going back to the language about cuts, I think that's a fair word to use because we have a our superintendent who's led us for years into a very strong sort of academic and financial place. And this is the recommended budget. So taking things away from it, I understand the zero percent and all of that, but it is a cut. This is what you're recommending. And I put my trust in that. And I've done sort of a lot of asking around and background resource myself to sort of see if there are squishy areas or places where things can be tightened. And A, it doesn't seem that there is, and it would be, if it is, it's such a small, uh, small amount that really, I think for me, I'm very satisfied that it's responsible, it's appropriate, and I'm completely in support of it. And I trust you, and I trust the teachers and the students to tell us what, what they need. And I think this is responding to that, um, both with the math coaches and with the culinary teacher. Um, I'm not someone who's wonderful in the kitchen, but <laughs> as I was getting texts tonight before cooking dinner, I was microwaving. But um, but I think you know, just the one thing I would add on on that on that piece of it is that you know, we when I look at our theories of action, it's welcoming, inclusive, trust, collaboration, engagement. There are a group of students, there are students where culinary and that those courses really are their source of connection to the school, to the school community, to the teachers. And so I think. That's not captured in numbers. It's not captured in test scores and maybe some of the things on the more elaborate, you know, indicators of, of where we are. But those are those are the things that matter to students, individual students. And to me, we're seeing that need, we're seeing that ask from from the school and from the students. And to to turn to turn away from that to me just doesn't seem like it fits with with our theories of action. Well, so I'm in support. So I want to thank um, you and, and Joe. I mean, I think you guys have done a tremendous amount of work and and have de continually demonstrated how carefully you think about the budget um, and the time and just to answer all the questions and all the presentations and the level of just um, nuanced discussions that have happened. And so with that, I feel very confident that the budget that you have presented us has been to been determined through your analysis as what the school needs, what the region needs. Um, I respect everyone in this room and their opinion, um, but 
wholeheartedly, I feel that 100% um, in support of the budget. I think it is a high number, but everything is high. And I think that we're overcoming a lot of different struggles, legacy struggles, um, and this will position us to, to at least continue on the path toward excellence, right? Um, and I really do appreciate everybody's work on this um, because I think that it's hard to talk about what what is needed for the district to run. Um, and I think that it was put together with a lot of care and attention um, for the administrators, for the staff, and more importantly for the students um, and the community. So thank you for the support. Um, Councilor Lee. I guess I, I just want to push back on a couple things I've heard um, as we've been having this discussion. And, and one of them is that um, this 4.8 million increase is, is new stuff. Is the, it's all new stuff that we're, we're adding to the budget this year. I think we have we have all understood year over year that when we talk about, say, a 0% budget, such as what you're projecting, that that does mean cuts because we have contractual obligations. Um, and we have, um, you know, obligations to our students that we need to meet. Um, and so a 0% is saying we need to make cuts to make up for those other things that we, um, those other obligations that we need to, to, to have. Um, and so I would push back on that whole 4.8 million being things that we have now that are, are things that we don't have right now. A good chunk of that 4.8 million, and maybe this is something we can ask for or you know, um, expand on, but a good chunk of that 4.8 million is just contractual obligations. And I was looking, I was on my phone here, and I was looking for, you know, there was a number of a number of paras that this budget has to absorb, the paras that were added over the last year to accommodate for student needs that were added over the last year that now have to be absorbed into this budget. So, you know, these are things um, that I don't think was just like brand new in this budget. And if we don't, if we just cut, say, culinary enhancements and we, we say we remove from the ask, we uh, remove from the ask culinary enhancements or, um, you know, some of the line item increases in the capital budget or you know, our contributions to the pension fund. I don't think we get down to minus 4.8 that way. You know, there's there's a certain amount of this that is just contractual obligations. There's the money that we expected to get from the state that we didn't. There's things in there that are not levers that we're gonna be able to pull easily. Um, I guess what I would, what I think would inform the conversation a little more if we were going to talk about removing things from this budget would be how much of this is things, levers that we are not able to pull versus levers that we could pull. Um, and I think your slide deck actually talked to that, Josh, um, with you know some recommendations for levers we could pull. And one of them that jumped out to me that was pretty large was that you know, large, but not <laughs> 4.8 million large, was the, the 200,000 you know, additional capital expenditure. And you know, I, I think about this and all of the emails we received over the last year, two years, three years, of all of the things that have you know, broken in this district. And things are gonna break every year. You know, that's, that's the nature of the beast. But I do think, you know, we have done over time not a great job of keeping up with our facilities and you know those things are coming around um and they're and it feels like they're coming around like it feels like they're kind of piling on now but i think that's the result of you know not having consistently maintained those investments over time so, um, you know, I when I look at the levers that we have available to pull, I don't really want to pull that lever. I don't think that that's going to be in the best interest of the district. Um, 
I feel for anybody who um, is looking at their tax bill and is not able to meet that obligation. What I don't know is if they cut over and over a $200,000 capital investment plus a pension contribution plus two or three teachers or whatever it is, is whether that, um, to Heather's point earlier, whether that potential decrease to a mill rate is going to materially impact somebody's tax, tax burden. Um, and so I'm left with the only question that I can really ask myself is what would make me a good steward of this school district? Um, I, I don't see um, any part of this budget that I'm eager to move um, at this time. I am, I am not... Um, I'm not moved to make a kind of substantial cut or a substantial limit that would, you know, result in a, in a, in a substantial impact on anybody's mill. Um, so that's where I, I, uh, I also, I wanted to push back on one more thing, which was, you know, a spreadsheet of numbers comparing us to, to other districts. And I I think I might have had something to do with that speech. Uh, I, it, that spreadsheet was looking at um, budget proposals over the last five years and comparing growth over five years between us and other districts that are neighbors and dirt of ours. And really what I, I use that for is, um, you know, as we are going through our budgets each season is, you know, just to see where we are compared to our peers and, and, and what they're talking about. And I will say, you know, yes, this budget is is high, but it's 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 on the, the, the higher side of average. But it is not like twice as much as the median. It is not even fifty percent more than the median. It's it's a few percentage. It's a you know, um, you know, ours is a five eight three. The median for the dirt for the proposals in twenty four or twenty five is five point four six. Um, that may come down, you know, um, and I think it's fair to ask questions about taking, you know, like about what could possibly be needed from this budget. But I, I just want to push back on. I don't think we're like running away from. I do not think we're in the ball. Um, and, and I do think, as I said, I've kept this data for five years now. I think it's worth looking at and keeping and analyzing. Um, but it, I'm not convinced that it's showing me that we're, we're running away with it quite yet. So I guess what I'm saying in a very long, roundabout way <laughs> is that I'm supportive of the budget. I'm happy to hear discussion. I'm happy to hear people's ideas um, about what could be um, changed or removed or shifted possibly to a later year. Um, but as a good steward, I, I really, uh, the levers that have been presented to us are not ones that I'm ready for right now. Tom, do you want to go now since that's your spot or do you want to? I'll just let me wait, I'll wait. Right, go ahead. <laughs> wait, I'll wait. I'll oh, last... You want to have the last word, huh? If you're giving it to me, I'll take I'm it. I'm not giving it to you, because I get the last second. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. Nice try. Go ahead, Heather. I am happy that Heather said so much, because a lot of what you said I agree with. Um, I really do appreciate the work that went into the presentation of the budget, and I, too, don't see any lever levers that I'm at this moment, comfortable with pulling. Um, I think the only way we know what the citizens are comfortable with is if we hear from them. Um, I've only heard from a few people 
So I would like to see where I'm at after Wednesday. Um, but right now, I'm fairly comfortable with where we're at. I know it's high. I do really feel bad um, for people that are worried about their finances as well. Um, but right now, I'm kind of at that at that point for planning. Anyone else wants to just see, see what tells us? It made perfect sense. I got it. Um, so I'm interested to hear what people have to say on Wednesday. Um, at this point, I have not um, decided. Uh, I would say that really what I'm looking to get out of the conversation, and I, obviously we're, we're a regional school district. We're not, you know, we're not a standalone district. And in those districts, the, the boards of finance and whoever can, can look at a budget and say, the Board of Education budget say you need to you need to knock it down. Um, and you know, I, I have no idea. Maybe those original budgets are presented with the idea that they know they're going to be knocked down by you know the non-board of education members of the town committees. I don't know. Um, I do think it is possible to see an alternative that actually would move the needle enough. Um, to make a substantive impact and at least look at it and go, okay, like that's, that's, you know, clearly um, going to be a train wreck. Uh, but I don't think um, that's the thing. I'd, I'd someday like to be able to, at this level, I think that's a valid <laughs> conversation to have or, you know, but I'm not going to ask for that. I don't think there's support for that. So, that's that really is what I'm looking for. If you're if, if you're going to have a high school that's losing more than any other school in the district, and you're going to add a teacher, that's great because it supports the programs. The kid, you're still adding a teacher in a school that is that is losing enrollment, and I get that they're maybe coming from from study hall. And as a comprehensive high school, we should be, you know, providing all these opportunities. But again, at, at the the end of the day, like where do where do we where do we draw that line? I do think um, even cutting, you know, uh, pulling a few levers, even if it doesn't um, move the needle, um, should still be considered. I think that that is that is our job, right? If if you're going to fuss at me from saying six instead of five, eight, seven, I'm not picking you. But like then, I think it's fair to say, well, like um, you know, we can we can fuss over, you know. A, you know, a 0.35 or something like that. So um, point that out. Uh, and I forgive me, I was on the phone. I was look, trying to look something up, something Mr. Spirito said, and I couldn't find it. So, um, uh, so anyway, I will um, just wait and see what happens. So I'm just going to say <laughs> right, so I do feel right in, in change right, both of you guys. This is a very fair budget in the facts where I think that you guys realize this number, and I don't like saying high, but this number was, right, more than our district has seen, maybe not last year, but in previous years, you were very cognizant of that fact, where I do feel like, right, you could have thrown other things in there. Are there other things that we need in this district, right, that we kind of have on this path forward um, but you guys were responsible and respectful of the community. So that I appreciate, right? I'm in full support of 5.83, but I would also be into like last year, right? When finance editor, like throw some more money in there. And right, so because they were worried about the capital piece, I'm extremely worried about the capital pieces. When you sent the email about like tape or something on an air conditioning system, the right? Gym like the gym unit, right? But, but it's like, those are things that are going to come fast and furious at us, and it's been kind of building for a while, but then there's this breaking point, this pressure point, and I feel like we're right there where it's like the things were smaller breaking, but now they're bigger. So, like, I don't think we can pull a CapEx, and I don't think there's a lot of other levels to pull. I don't want to pull programming. And I actually kind of disagree with the fact, like, if I'm spending tax dollars and my kid is sitting in study hall, like, and they have 
and they wanted to do an academic class, but they can't because we can't fulfill that. Like, I think that's a big miss on our district and everything that we stand for. So whether it's culinary, I don't care, whatever it is, run around the track, do something. If they want to do something, right, I want to make sure that we have the supports in place to allow the children to do that. So full support of the budget, you know, the, I'm sure they won't this time, but if they said, you got to put more in capital, I'm good with that too. Um, to kind of get some of these things, support systems. All right, Tom. I'll go now. All right. <laughs> um, first off, I very much want to thank everyone who came out and presented during this cycle. I know that is not easy to be out late nights um, and spending that time with us. I know that's not everyone's favorite thing to do. Thank you to all the presenters. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the administrators and all the staff members who had a hand in putting this budget together. Um, as usual, I think this has been a very thoughtful process. I think this has been a very thorough process. Um, I very much appreciate your willingness to at least try to answer our questions if we let you get through them. Um, we, we did, we asked you some tough ones. Um, and on that note, I also very much appreciate the passion in this room. Um, and you can see that passion come out in some of the reactions. Um, that's a double-edged sword, you know, so it makes us, what makes us a tremendous board to work with. And it makes us very good advocates for this district. Um, the other side of that, that I've noticed recently is I do think at times it impairs our ability to come to the table and have an, I don't want to use the word negotiation, but a conversation. Um, and I'm not just going to say it about tonight, but there have been a couple of stops this year, actually going back to the end of last year, and I'm not going to call them out specifically, where I feel far too many conversations, there have been a difference of opinion at the table, but the discussion has become binary. Um, a good example of this, there's a lot of room between, I, and by the way, Heather, you're absolutely right. Like, let me address, I was not suggesting that this is 4.8 million of new mm -hmm. stuff. It's 4.8 million of new dollars. There's inflation built into that for sure. But there is anywhere from 10 to a dozen levers that if you pull any one of them on average is gonna bring this budget down about 100 grand, including the five and a half positions we're having, right? But you could take a million away and provide the exact same level of service, including inflation, including the contractual obligations in fact, I'd actually be interested to know what that is if we didn't add any of the enhancements, which is not what I'm advocating for. Let me be super clear. But if I was to say, Josh, what would it cost me to provide the exact same level of service, which I don't think anyone at this table would say is poor. Give me everything you have this year and build in all those contractual obligations. What does that number look like? And I think you'll find that the, the optional things that we are adding on to enhance our service offerings if we took them all away, it does account for probably seven figures conservatively, right? Now that is not what I'm advocating to do, all right? I'm super clear about that. But on the other side of that, so you can't tell me that we can't find a single dollar, like that every dollar is spoken for, especially in a year when we're running a surplus at the moment, uh, as large as we're, we're running. Um, I would love to see this board, you know, hearing that there is some reservation Although not enough reservation to have the votes, right? But sometimes it's not about pushing it through with the votes. Sometimes it's taking a look and saying, is there anything we could do to come to a compromise so that this full board feels like they can support it and have been heard? I know that's been a conversation we've had around the budget for a long time with different people on different sides of that perspective. But um, to me, that's a bit disappointing that this has become, this is what Josh has proposed and it's not for us to discuss it. Um, I worry about that. Like, I think there's a fallacy, and Steve, you started to expose it a little bit tonight. On the one hand, there are people saying, if you can't make a significant enough cut to affect my taxes, if my taxes only go down $10, what's the point of cutting it? But on the other hand, it is very clear, we're not willing at this table to make a significant cut that would affect people's taxes. We're not making a seven-figure cut. Like, that's never making it through this board, nor should it, in my opinion. Right? But you're telling me I can't make the big cut that'll affect people, but if I can't do it, why is it worth making a small cut? 
There's a lot of room in between there, but you put me between a rock and a hard place where I can't even have the discussion of, you're telling me I can't find 200 grand? And then add on top of that, you know, I've heard people say, well, this is what Josh is telling us he needs. I understand that. But if, if that's the standard, spare me the 25 hours of meetings we've been through, because I'll know what the number is. We, this board in my four years um, has not significantly pushed back on the proposed budget, uh, except for the time we added to it in my first year. Um, I pushed back on the notion, I hope you don't feel beat up. We ask some tough questions, but when we talk about people who like to trade places this time of year, I hope you feel like one of them that's happy where they are. Because I think if you took a look around at other districts, what we've done here is very easy. Budgets, Heather, you referenced it. It's one thing to look at the medium of proposed budgets. It's another to see where they ended up once they were cut. Our nearest neighbor, Newtown, cut a million out of the proposed budget. So if it's in your sheet at 5.5, knock it down to 4 point something. Now, some of that is playing games because they have a town that takes care of their capital expenses. So half of that liability was put on the town, but still, the proposed budget lost half a million dollars. That's just next door, all right? I'm sure we could all spot check and find different districts, but it's very rare to find a district that for four straight years didn't cut a single dollar, not one penny from what was proposed. So I want to be very clear. Um, I'm very much in support of this district. I, I worry about being painted as a, a bit of a villain here for asking these questions. Um, because I, I don't think they're unreasonable tasks. Um, I would jump right away to capital. Heather, you brought that up, and you're right. We do have an outsized need for capital, uh, and $200 won't get us there. But we kind of double and triple dip on that line when we say, well, we're going to fund the debt service 100 grand, and that's coming right back you know, into capital projects if we don't spend it in other areas, right? Uh, we have uh, 200 or so falling off the bottom next year. Where's that 200 grand go? You know, well, that's probably also going to be used if it's available at the end of the year towards capital projects as well. We still have bond money. We've, we've built up from 100 grand to 1.2 million, a capital budget. I think there's some money if you wanted to throw the people around this table and say, you know what, maybe as a sign of good faith, we can cut this down. I think there's there's a big range between zero and 200,000 to say maybe we don't need to make that big jump and double what we do for capital. A um, couple of other things, I wanna make sure I hit them all. Um, I did ask some tough questions. I think people maybe assumed um, they thought that was representative of how I felt on things. Uh, I'm the biggest champion in the world for culinary. Uh, at no point was I, um, you know, against a culinary addition. Um, my concern the other night was that I did feel that it came out of the blue at the budget presentation. I had not even talked about these projects for 15 months, and I had never heard that. I feel the same way about the 200 grand. You know, when we talked about how are we going to pay for all this stuff, I've heard we have the bond. I've heard we have the debt service, which is falling off. We've talked about openly, like, we are going to have to get on a more regular cycle of bonding. But at no point before the budget was presented did I hear, oh, I'm probably going to have to double capital improvements. Now, I'm not saying I disagree with the strategy, but to me, my gut reaction when I was unprepared for it is, does it have to be that much so simple? I hear a lot about the um, being shortchanged from Hartford and people kind of looking at that and saying, well, if it wasn't for that, we can't change that, all right? We got, we got dealt a bum hand by Hartford. I think we would all agree. But you got to play the cards you dealt. And when revenue goes down like that, the answer isn't let's buy more stuff. We have to adjust. This is the second year in a row where we have a budget approaching six. Um, Josh, you said last time, like, I don't see us at any point getting back to the days of two or three percent. What that tells me then is we have to maybe change our approach and not be as aggressive with some of these additions until we get out of this inflationary environment. Because I'm telling you now, I don't think we can continue it year after year, 6%, 6%, 6%-ish. Sorry, 5.8, 5.9, 5.7. I don't think that's a sustainable 
path for our taxpayers. Um, some of this, what I'm saying now, is not even necessarily about this year, but I'm hoping factors into next year. Like, I think there's a bit more resistance, whether or not we pass a proposal or not, there's a bit more resistance around this table than we've had in years past. Um, you know, take that for what it will, but I think at some point we're going to get to a, a level where it's hard to tolerate your leader. Um, I do worry about fatigue. We had a high budget last year. We have a high budget this year. We had a bond. We asked the community for a bond last year. We're probably asking them for another big bond in a year or two, and that's that's last in line. How far can we push our taxpayers before they say enough is enough? I don't want it to be on that last stop, not even knowing where, where the budget is, right? So I think if there's a possibility to show some good faith, we should take advantage of that. Uh, I'll, f I'll finish here by saying the need is always going to outpace our ability to spend and to fund. We are always going to have more needs than we do dollars to pay for them. That's our job, is to figure out where is that tolerance to pay. Um, I think we're being a bit too aggressive this year. Um, I would like to see us make a, um, a reasonable reduction. Um, I don't think it's up for me to tell you what line it should come from, but if we can find 20, 30 basis points, I don't think that's asking for a lot. You know, 200,000 out of this budget, um, I think would be a very good sign that we are not out of touch with what our communities are feeling in terms of all of these things becoming more expensive. Um, so that's that. Thank you. Um, Thanks for not keeping me at three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I when we went up to the, the state capitol, they sprung the three minutes. Yeah. I did not know. Yeah. And so I'm there and I'm like, oh, this is a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> and I didn't get to anything or read everything. So I, I sympathize. <laughs> um, so thank you, everyone, um, for taking the time and um, discussing uh, where your thoughts are in this respectful and civil manner. Um, I went into this budget open to a conversation about where board members wanted to go. Um, I certainly was open to the conversation about having more incremental moves. Um, and I want, I purposely you know, like I said, I tried my very best to keep an open mind um, to hear um, what the administration had to say and what board members had to say. Um, I do have to push back, Tom, a little bit on um, your saying that there's not an opportunity to discuss your thoughts. And I think that there has been opportunities to discuss. That was not, if I said that, I have to apologize. Yeah. An opportunity to entertain an idea. If you're gonna yeah. eliminate both I, I, I think there has been opportunities to entertain ideas. Like I, I think there there I has been an openness to discuss mm -hmm. um, you know, to in in a lot more conversation than years past, as a matter of fact, I would say, about exploring the possibility of going lo lower. Um and you know, 25 hours of meetings, there's been plenty of opportunities to um I don't know if it's been 25 hours, I just took that quote from you, but um I think there's been opportunities to have a push and pull. Um, I think that, um, again, like I would be, I would have been open to hearing more about incremental moves, um, but hearing what some of the board members said tonight, I thought particularly Heather Dwyer, very persuasive about the um, maintaining the capital um, expenditures, I get, It's hard hearing about the repairs and the risks that we are currently under. We just heard, I don't know if it was in your notes, um, about a million dollar. Gym, the main, the main gym. Hey, thank you. So that that one piece of equipment cost a million dollars. It's the HVAC. Yeah. Right? It, it, if you look up, it's it looks it's like half the size of this room. Right. Um, so, and you hear that things like that are having trouble and you're coming up with a fix that's a, a significant chunk of money to fix equipment that is 
over a decade beyond its useful life. That's actually not as old as the rest of it. Oh, the other stuff? That's okay. actually but newer. There, there's, there's a great, <laughs> great. That's a <laughs> piece, Joe. Still relying <laughs> there. The older stuff is still running good. Yeah, but we have so much equipment that is beyond its useful life. And it just, it's a, a constant state of anxiety that we we live with. And then, and then never mind like the MIJ heating system, like you guys are, again, still band-aiding that, which I understand it's a big cost to fix that. But these are the discussions that we have. So capital is a very important item because we are currently faced with catastrophe at any time. And I will never forget the time we had a boiler go. This is before you and you were here. And it was a $600,000 loss. And how, how like that is an incredible amount of money that we had not budgeted for. Um, and that was back in the time when we had, you know, freezes starting in October. And it's just, it's not a, a good place to be. I really like the proactive view of saying, you know, we have aging equipment that we're gonna have to address. Um, and we want to be able to address it because unlike other districts that are not regional or the towns that have reserves, we're not allowed to have a big reserve. Um, we have a you know a, a million dollar capital reserve right now that we've tried yeah. to build up. Um, but I would even say that's not enough because when a six hundred thousand dollar boiler goes, there goes your reserve. Um, so we don't have the um, a fallback that other districts do. Um, and that's why we have to be more careful about our planning. So I think I agree a lot with what you said, Heather. Um, and in terms of like now you're, you know, you kind of convinced me, I don't know if I want to make an incremental move lower on the capital. Um, and, you know, just to throw in about the, um, the math coach, when we have teachers and administrators asking for additional professional development for our teachers, it's a no-brainer to me because I want student achievement. I want people to feel supported. Um, and I think that's why we're here. Um, so to me, the fact that the administration also is putting one of the math coaches in their Title I grant shows how much they want it. Um, and again, I want to give the teachers and the administrators what they're asking for in that extra professional development for teachers because I do believe that that is going to um, enhance our education and as far as the culinary um, you know doing the upgrade I knew it was going to bring in some more students to already you know the most demanded class um, in our high school um, I don't like the idea that so many kids are sitting in study hall um, and I know that, that sometimes because they don't want to do like some of these other more esoteric, like my daughter's never going to do woodworking if it's available, you know, but she'll always do culinary. Um, I think there's a lot of kids that would take that option. And so take them out of study hall. I think that's a, a really attractive um, option. And I think Heather is right that we do provide a lot of investing into AP classes and, and offerings. And I do think that the culinary not only offers a life skill, um, but also offers soft skills in terms of like how they're collaborating with each other. And, you know, maybe someone who doesn't shine academically can really shine in, in, um, in a culinary environment and doing projects with other groups. So I, I am in favor of that as well. Um, so, you know, I am also interested to hear, you know, from the public. I think Heather's spot on about that. We've had a couple people speak. Um, I've also heard um, not a lot of complaints about the budget. Um, even on, you know, it's just, it, I haven't heard much. Like I've heard, I've seen at times when people are really complaining a lot and this is not one of those times. So I do put weight in what I'm hearing out in the community. Um, and again, it's not over. We still have a couple more meetings. Um, there's a public hearing coming up on Wednesday, another opportunity for public comment at our next meeting whenever we vote on the budget. So, and you can always email. 
um, and definitely up for hearing about that. But that's where I am um, right now. So I guess where I am is that I'm in support um, of the budget. So what I'm hearing is that we don't need necessarily any additional um, information from you, Mr. Smith, or, or Mr. Martino, that we have enough within but what the uh, FCC, what is the number to provide the exact level of services we have this month? So I think that we're trying to answer questions as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I think when you get into like black funding a budget, um, there's discussion and, and conversations that that um, the board would need to, to make there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to usurp that. Um, like we present a budget, the budget is, is for you to discuss and for you to decide. This year, again, we started with that 4.7 and then the, the question from Hartford is, we did take that and we absorbed that so that that now sets our budget going forward with a lower expectation from Hartford. So that is a $600,000 hole that we are absorbing in this increase that we didn't know about when this year's budget was built. We were promised $600,000 more. Um, the, the correction though is a, is a one-time correct. We're gonna absorb it this year. We have no choice. And we, we could roll the dice and hope that Hartford fixes it for next year. So this is the, the, the most conservative view of that. I, I, I would not put my faith in, in a biennial. But so so the level film with the budget assumes a six hundred thousand dollar cut right off the top because that's revenue that we wouldn't have next year. Um, the like I guess we work for you. This is a budget that we propose. If you want us to make it, it, it I made a recommendation or I go to a slide of whatever that was four hundred thousand four twenty five. I don't remember what was in there four fifty. Um, that would move some numbers. Um, if you want us to propose a I don't know, whatever that number is, how would you get to 2 million, 4 million? The challenge with that is we are going to talk about services because the level fund a budget, you know, I guess you build in whatever. We could build in some things. We could build in some scenarios, but those scenarios could have impacts that then, um, like some people would say, like, well, how much if we cut sports? Well, now you got people that it starts to get emotional in the community. So if we're going to do that, I would like some direction from the entire board to say, build us a couple of scenarios, double that, triple that, whatever. Again, at some level, I care very much about this place, but at the end of the day, I work for the board and the community. And if you, and, and so like there's, there's math involved, right? Mm -hmm. I can do it clinically and say, here's how we get to, I've, I've been in places where the budget failed and you have to make cuts. Um, like we can come up with those proposals, but I, I want some direction. So I'm not doing it without some where you want us to look or go. Sure. You know, I mean, you have the numbers for all of the the pieces. You can you can build some scenarios. You have the whole book. What do you slot in when you add an FTE for salary? And Sixty-five benefits? thousand. Sixty-five salary and benefits. So the benefits are a little different because yeah. we're self-insured, and there's yeah. like, I mean, we you could you could budget officially um, like twenty-eight thousand for a family plan, but is that going to be a single person, a family person? Did someone get married that's here or have a child or get divorced? So we tend we tend to um, look at that like a, a twenty thousand uh, dollar, but we say eighty five an FTE. Yeah, you know, and, and then so like an ML teacher, I probably put a little more in there because you're probably not going to get a first year ML teacher. Uh, like our coaches, I budget a little higher for that. So I might like budget like a hundred for each of those seventy five somewhere you know um, for the base salary, mm -hmm. and then again benefits have a lot of sliders to them. So um, we tend to budget that more like holistically, where we take the overall budget amount and we um, add the multiplier of from the um, financial planner and then Joe's budget right. or whatever his plan is. Yeah. Um, you know, and so like that's kind of the um, the insurance or the benefits are slightly different. Um, but then like, what do you want us to do for estimates on fuel, estimates on electricity? You know, like. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I don't think when you say like, not asking for those things. No, but like, so when you say like, how much does it cost to run school this year? Well, I mean, you have slides, I guess, with kind of the new stuff. 
Um, we don't have to have this conversation. I can tell. I don't want to waste anyone's time. Yeah. It's you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not wasting anyone's time. I appreciate that. But I think I think what Josh is saying, like if you look on page of 21 of his slideshow from his budget presentation, there's that risk tolerance. Yeah. And that that gets you like yes. that was a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar like you know the debt service mm -hmm. the pension the capital repair like those kind of yeah. things. It's a, at that point it's a very simple answer. I'll take eighty five times it by five point five. And then, you know, add it to whatever's on that response phase and come with a number. My, my only cost will be the ML teacher and the special ed teacher um, are our ability to deliver services um, that are mandated by state and federal law. So, like, I, I, I don't, I understand what you're saying, but yeah. there's, like, there's discretionary needs, um, what things like culinary, again, and it wasn't a surprise. Like, so there is, when we build this, there's, 50 other things that could have made it into a budget, mm -hmm. you know, that we have conversations with administrators. Is this the time? What do we get? What's that cost benefit? What's the tolerance? You know, and, and in the end, like that calling on teacher was between a 5.7 and a 5.8, you know, um, and so do, and probably a little less than that, but um, do I make that decision or do I say that the no. culinary room is pretty important to the board? I'm going to put it out there and you guys decide. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'd actually like to know what is, what was cut? Because that speaks to what we left off of the budget. Well, I mean, the short answer is we could have dodged the loophole of what we put into. To no, no, but like seriously, when you're having those conversations, yeah. I'd like to understand what was on, what was left off because the timing isn't right. Is that going to help us prepare for future budgets when the timing is right? And what type of shift in education would those things potentially add? Or was it like, oh, we're kind of teetering. We don't want a six, so we're going to leave that. And maybe it's just a numbers game. But to me, that's important to understand what are we leaving behind when we're having conversations about what we need today? Because to me, that helps me also think about, okay, you know, what are the needs? And I think that's a little unfair, kind of what I'm hearing, because I feel like when it's like, well, what are we gonna, and you didn't necessarily answer, um, this is addicts, so I don't, but, like, well, you want to cut something. Like, I don't, again, if, we're, if it was a regular school district and they had to cut something, does the board go and look at the book and make the decisions and say, here's where I think we should do it? Or does that fall first to the superintendent and his cabinet? Yeah, yeah. That's but, 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 and it's kind of like, well, if you can just somehow be like, well, the budget would have been an extra percent because, and I'm going to show you why, because the board member has asked and said, well, we would have done this, 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 and this, and it would have gotten us to like 6.6, .6, but we stopped because we wanted to be under six. Fine. But then, then I think it should just, it should work in reverse and we should be able to, you should be like, and well, this, 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 and this would have been what, if we didn't put it in, would have gotten us to, you know, a lower number. Like I, I like I think if it's your judgment call to tell us what you were going to add, it should be your judgment call to not direct us back to the book to make cuts, but to to, to rely on your um, experience. I don't I don't want to say I don't want to come up and say well I think it should be sports. No, I, like, I agree with you. Yeah. So okay. so what I would say mm -hmm. um, so the, the danger is with with your asking. Then you also say like here's something that we chose not to do, and you start to put it out there, and, and then you get into this kind of well, I want that instead of the culinary, you know, like, so again, you have very caring administrators, teachers in this district, and, and we kind of go through, is this part of a strategic move? Like, and we, we do talk about those things. And we don't start with a number, um, but we do talk about like, and I, I know it's like, I'm not looking to be flip or funny that we're lower than last year, but we would have been significantly lower. And then in other places, so this is um, how it's worked. So if the, if the board of finance cuts you eight hundred thousand dollars, then I would come up with a couple of different ways to get to eight hundred thousand dollars. I wouldn't ask you to necessarily go through the book and find it. You might say, "Thank you for your recommendations. Have you thought about these things over here?" Or I don't like that. I want like, and we can have that conversation. Or say, "Give me two ways to get to eight hundred thousand, or preserve this but get to you know." Um, so then there's again, there's a lot of different ways that towns do that. It depends a little bit on where the capital is, on who managed the self-insurance fund. Like there's other there's mm -hmm. other ways. And then, so like, we don't know, I mean, I have an idea of the mill rate impact, but oftentimes it's the town trying to get to a certain mill rate. Like I think Southbury held the mill rate flat for the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. Some of that's because of the ADM shift, some of that's because they use other dollars to offset it. So like, I can only tell you here what our school budget is, 
And then the towns have to calculate that mill rate in fact. Um, and so that's where like, we'll have that conversation on Wednesday a little bit, but that's normally like the town will say, we need to get to a mill rate of X, uh, or we need to hold the mill rate flat. This is what we need from the schools. Um, to be clear, Tom asked a question, so then you're just gonna calculate based on the numbers. It's like, because I was interested in the answer. So you're, you'll be doing some yeah. calculations. Yeah, like it's not exact. I mean, I kind of already, in my head, but like, I'll, I'll, we don't need to. Sure, I mean, I don't think it's gonna have any impact. I'm just for my own curiosity. You know, since there's some confusion about it around the table. Well, so, right, I think it's unfair of you to say, I'm going to take this offline and do something and then make the bold statement that we're not having open and honest conversations here. So I think that's disingenuous to the rest of us when you said, well, no one's willing to move. I no. never said open and honest conversations. That is pretty words. No, happened. I'm saying yeah. you said that no one was willing to move and then no one's willing to push back and no one's willing to challenge the piece, which to me, it means that you don't feel like we're having open and honest conversation where we stand, but then you're like, well, I'll take it off black. So like, to me, that's kind of like, well, do we want to have it? Because I'm more than willing to have a conversation, right? But it has to go the other way. If you say, okay, I want to cut the culinary teacher, mm -hmm. like then I want to talk about what else we can add back into the thing because I'm not hearing from the community, right? And that's what we're here for, right? That this is an issue. I'm hearing people want programs and want components for their children. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make sure that we're having the conversation here together, yeah. right? And and it's not like, right? We're 10 different people with 10 different backgrounds. Like we're never going to agree. And that's fine. Like, so there's been votes we've sat around this table and I've now voted and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I move on, right? But like, but 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 I have those conversations. I'm saying that loud. So just like that kind of I'm gonna take it offline situation kind of throws me a little because we should yeah right regardless we should all say where we think where we are and be transparent with each other. I want to make very clear the words open and honest never came out of my mouth. I think we've been nothing but open and honest. So I I guess you heard that in what I said, but it's not my intention if it came across over. Be very clear about that. Um, I'm trying to spare everyone from sitting around here in five minutes, but if you want to pull up a spreadsheet and I can do the tabulation I was going to do home on my own, I don't think it's going to be to anyone's benefit. I'm not suggesting, when I say take it, like, I have a lot of notes in my notebook. Like, I take a lot, I do a lot of homework. I'll do my own homework and let you all leave five minutes earlier, unless you really want to pull up a spreadsheet. And we can do that computation, but it's not something I'm pushing. Well, I just want to know where you're going with it, right? So if you're saying, like, I want to cut $85,000 and it needs to be whatever this ML teacher, yeah. what, which it can't be, the culinary yeah. teacher, right? Like, before we go, like, I don't want to say, like, Josh, go do that. When it's, like, when you're outvoted 8 to 10, right, 8 to 2. So then it's, like, well, then, like, are we having this conversation? Or will we know, like... I feel like Josh right? sufficiently answered my question. I have the information. Oh. That's where I should. And I'm not suggesting I'm going to do anything with it. I'm just curious. But thank you for giving me that space. Okay. Okay. I, won't have to say. I know it's late. Um, so I'd be the first one to say that having those zeros way back when, certainly had we gone and maybe put some of that into capital or pension that. You know, I mean, you know, a, a, a extra 10 years ago with the stock market, you know, maybe we wouldn't have to fund pension as much as we had to. And obviously the capital argument, you know, you, know, you all can follow. Um, clear, had we not done zeros, you know, it, 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 it wasn't like we would have done a three or a four. Like it would have been um, a lot lower uh, than a three or a four. And again, please keep in mind um, that in a way it was the, a community to say people, you know, the no's still had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of votes two years in a row for a zero. Um, and it was absolutely a different time. But I think there have been a lot of decisions uh, since then that boards for the past have 10 years have collectively, you know, what we have here is a collection of all of our decisions, good and bad. The reason that we have to maintain the salary line item is because we as a board voted for all those salaries, right? 
so it's it's there's and and so there's there's a lot going on. So I just really um, at the time it was absolutely a different environment. Um, and to your point, had we actually wanted to raise the raise it zero again, it was this binary option. And and truly, what I am looking for really is I, I just I, I would love again excellent comments. I, I would just love to be able to not have the binary um, the binary discussion. But I did take um, a little offense at earlier remarks that said um, people that were here at the time made the zeros and therefore, you know, bear some responsibility. And it's true, um, you do bear some responsibility for where we are now. Um, but I would challenge uh, anyone else at this table to have done a better job at that time because there were people that would have dragged it below zero if it was illegal. So, or walked out. Yeah, yeah. And, and Steve. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, no, no, please. I just yeah. I needed to. Yeah, that, but, that's yeah. Say that. Um, right. I was not on the board at that time, but I do remember you were advocating for a higher number than yes. the zero, yes. and you're like, "Don't let's not do this." Yes. You you absolutely I, were. Yes. But it's just yeah. we can't keep again with the zeros. But oh my gosh, okay. We have a five eight three. I'm officially done with blaming the zeros. <laughs> this gets through. <laughs> But uh, anyway, but I just needed to. I just um, I took a little offense at that. Actually, yeah. and I just wanted to hold it on. Was it sure it was not? No, it was a much harder time. Yes, for sure. Um, we do have an opportunity to have more budget discussions coming up on Wednesday, and then again. So um, I don't think I'm cutting us short, unless anyone disagrees. If we can move on. Okay. Um, so yeah, other vote, important. the vote is still going to be the eighth. Oh, yeah. Well, hold, I'm going to get to that when oh, we okay. do the announcement. Okay, sorry. Well, because it was like budget discussion, budget vote, and then yeah. it was like, okay, okay. we're going to get, gonna get to setting the budget <laughs> vote date. I just was going to do that during announcements. Okay. Um, so regular business requiring board action may have a motion to establish the Comprod High School graduation date. Absolutely. Move that the Board of Education set Comprod High School's graduation date for June 15, 2024, per state statute 10-161, establishment of graduation date that provides 180 days of school. Do I have a second? Okay. Second by Shane Ms. Cavallo. I know that was painful for you and okay. Rogers to do that. I was living in denial. I know. Oh, that's what, that's what it's what's going to happen. Any discussion or questions? No? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. That carries. Thank you. Next, I have a motion for approval of Connecticut State Health and Food Certification. Does it not go ahead? Mm -hmm. yeah. Pursuant to CGS Section 10 215 F. The Regional School District 15 Board of Education certifies that all food items offered for sale to students in the school under in the schools under its jurisdiction and not exempted from the Connecticut Nutritional Standards published by the Connecticut State Department of Education will comply with the Connecticut Nutrition Standards during the period of July 1st, 2024 through June 30th, 2025. This certification shall include all food offered for sale to students separately from reimbursable meals at all times and from all sources, including but not limited to school stores, vending machines, school cafeterias, culinary programs, and any fundraising activities on school premises sponsored by the school or non-school organizations and groups. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Steve. Any questions? I wish we'd have let them have a couple of get more to the L bus, whatever. I really like it. So, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Any other comments? <laughs> other than Heather not trying to follow the law. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. It carries. Next, may I have a motion for approval of Connecticut health, State Healthy Food Certification? Sorry. Uh, move that the Regional School District 15 Board of Education will allow the sale to students of food items that do not meet the Connecticut Nutrition Standards and beverages not listed in Section 10-221Q of the Connecticut General Statutes, provided that the following conditions are met. One, the sales in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. Two, the sales at the location of the event. And three, the food and beverage items are not sold from a vending machine or school store. 
an event is an occurrence that involves more than just a regularly scheduled practice, meaning an extracurricular activity, for example, soccer games, school plays, and interscholastic debates are events. But soccer practices, play rehearsals, and debate team meetings are not. Regular school day is occurring at midnight before 30 minutes after the end of the official school day. The location means where the event is being held it must be the same place as the meeting that says. Second. Thank you, Shannon. Steve, you sound like the guy that did the press is great. He's like, <laughs> yeah. He was like, I'm going to read it. You two are slow. We're like, make sure to read every word because you have to do it again. So he's like, yeah. I'm done. All right. Any questions or comments? All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, next we have announcement of future meetings. So on Wednesday, March 27th, we have another budget workshop. Um, we're starting with the boards of finance from both Middlebury and Southbury here at the High School Media Center at 6.30. And there will be a public hearing following that at 7.30. Um, regarding our next um, PNC and regular meeting of the Board of Education, um, it we have a few board members who are unable to be in person on Monday, April 8th, which was supposed to be our budget adoption date. Um, everyone is available on April 2nd. That's Tuesday, April 2nd um, instead. Um, and I believe PNC will move to that date as well if the board decides that we want to do our budget vote instead of you know we'll move the april 8th date to the april 2nd date i just wanted to know if everyone was okay with that moving to april 2nd for our budget vote consensus yes 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 okay so i will announce that on tuesday april 2nd pnc will meet at the high school at 6 30 and then on Tuesday, April 2nd, we will have a special meeting of the Board of Education at the High School Media Center at 7.30, where we will be doing our um, budget adoption. So take note, public, of the change in date. Um, we are planning, hopefully, on voting um, for our budget on April 2nd. And then May 8th, is the referendum date for the adoption of the budgets for both the towns and the school. I have a quick question. Yeah. Do we have um, finance on Wednesday, April 3rd? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. No. Okay. Yep. Finance, April 3rd. 12 o'clock. 12 o'clock. All right. Any other questions? All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> All right.